This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, you ain't gonna touch me, you're not gonna do nothing, you are not above me, I bet you wish you was me, I know this that I know. This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, I know that I know. Come on. What happened now? Just keep folding me? It says I'm disconnected? I'm not disconnected, you c No. And shit, I have Queen Jack of Hearts. Two pair. All right, I'm out of here. I'm too steamed up. This mother This is this is, this is this is the pain of online poker. The pain of online poker. Do you think you're big, better than Phil Ivy? That was the best. That was the best question. <laughs> That might have tilted him more. I don't even think it was the internet. It might have just been like that one question just lingering right. at the bottom of the screen. 
and it never goes away. Yeah. And it might never go away for his whole career. It's like <laughs> literally what they what they ask him all the time. All right, everyone, welcome back. The Saw for Why vlogcast. It is upon us once again. It is Wednesday, of course. So we are here in studio. Myself, Christian Soto, my main man, Big Bet, Alpha Reg, Berkey. I need some new nicknames for you now. Do we? Yeah. At some point, we... we Caleb's gotta... been calling me Old Man Berkey. Wow. On uh, on stream. O OMB. Yeah. Nah, that doesn't suit you well. I've been going around these fish shaking tirades. I've did, I've seen those. I've yeah. seen those. Uh, they're entertaining though. Sure. Uh, yesterday you had three thousand people watching you. You were peaking. Um, shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I shut it right down at the peak. I feel like it's been a it's it's been a wild week for you. Like it's yeah. been it's been a wild week. Like really highs, really lows, and the people get to a little bit of a glimpse, right? A little bit, just a smidge. <laughs> <laughs> and I get a little bit of a glimpse. I a lot I, of it goes on behind closed doors. Yeah, of course, of course. You know that's what the women say all the time. But uh, yesterday, I I tuned in. There was three thousand people watching. I was like, holy shit! Like I was playing at I was playing at the Aria, and uh, it's like you're you're like super famous now. I don't think that's true. <laughs> no, like you are. Like I was at Aria, and they were like, holy shit, Berkey's streaming. Like, oh, and they were like. How's he doing? Like they all want to like they all want to know like the cashiers talking about you. They're like, oh, like how's Berkey doing? Mm -hmm. The floor is like, oh, how's Berkey doing? I'm like, you know, I I'm a pro too. <laughs> like, what how am I doing? How's my life? <laughs> okay, like it's like when you have like this happens all in my family too. It's like I'm the I'm the oldest and I'm a boy. So like in Spanish culture, that's a huge deal. And it's like my sister is like, I walk in and like everybody's like, oh my god. Like, whatever, you know? And uh, my sisters are like, I'm hungry too. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm hungry. How was my day? You're like, so it, that's kind of how I feel. Like, that's our relationship. Like, you're like the big brother, and I'm like the little sibling, and I'm just like an Aria, like, yeah, I want to play 510. <laughs> 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 like, no, there's no game in Ivy's room. <laughs> So that's kind of what's going on. Like, God damn, I could you play. put your big boy pants on, man. There was no game. Get okay? in there and dick swing. There was no game in Ivy's room. Okay. I was there playing the biggest game in the room currently. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So the big story of the week. There's a new God. There is a, a new God upon us in this poker landscape. He won from a car. Allegedly, the store had a piece of his win. Sure. And uh, for those of you that haven't know, haven't uh, followed along, Ryan DePaulo, East Coast Grinder, also known as Joey the Mush, wins a bracelet. And I can't do it justice as much as this video can. So I'm going to play the video, and then we'll chat about it. All right. God, oh my fucking God, yo. Oh my fucking God, bro. Oh my fucking God, bro. Get the fuck out. Get the fuck out. I'm a legend. Sorry. <laughs> That's amazing. He goes on to say, he, he like, it doesn't stop there. So if y'all want to watch the full video, I'm sure it's out there, but. Uh, he goes on to pretty much like walk around and say, I'm a God. Like he's a legend. Was that a PT cruiser he was playing from? No, it's a Mitsubishi. I don't know what kind. <laughs> I think they retired the Eclipse. It looked like a minivan. He's the God of, of Mitsubishi. We're going to have to upgrade him to a Tesla now that he's, he's a legend. Uh, he might need another deep run. Uh, I heard he had a deep run yesterday. Uh, crazy thing though. It's, it's a crazy thing. He goes... To a parking lot. Seemingly plays all night from the parking lot. Maybe because the parking lot has Wi-Fi. I don't know. Yeah. And goes on to win a bracelet. Over $100,000. Bracelet. From a parking lot. In his car. Piss cups. Allegedly piss cups. And upgrades himself to a god. Like, I don't know. That might be one of the most legendary stories, though. But you have to be like, 
Only a person called Joey to mush can make that happen. Joey is a mush. That's his boy. It's a running joke. Like, yeah, yeah. You've seen his vlogs or whatever. So it's actually like really funny. I don't know how much of this is uh, directed from. Um, oh my God. Why can't I think of the name of the movie now? Uh, but there's a movie where I can't, bl- I'm so upset that I'm forgetting the name of it. It's a De Niro movie. And uh, they call this one guy a mush. Mm. Like every time they, he walks in the room or whatever, like he just uh, jinxes them or whatever. So he walks in whenever they have this big sports bet going on. And they're like, get the fuck out of here. Put him in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and they stuff him in the bathroom. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know like how much of it is a play on on uh, that movie. Uh, I mean, it's gonna frustrate me. I'll, I'll think of it like an hour and a half from now, and I'll just be like, ah. Um, but yeah, so Bronx Tale. I kept wanting to say Brooklyn. Um, so like I don't know how much of it is a play on that, but I know that like it's an ongoing theme in his vlogs where they call his boy Joey uh, mm-hmm. the Bush or whatever. Um, paid him homage in his WSOP name. Definitely like. This is what the the gambling stories look like in 2020, right? Like the degenerate stories of like, you know, the 90s and the 80s were Stu Unger mm. and these guys just blowing lines of coke off of strippers tits and, you know, <laughs> firing off hundreds of thousands on like all these degenerate activities and sports bets and everything else. Now we have guys who will drive from New York to New Jersey, play in a Whole Foods parking lot for 16 hours, <laughs> pissing in a cup. To run up a five hundred dollar buy in into a hundred and twenty thousand or something. So it gets better because Ryan is actually in our chat and he says that the car was a rental. <laughs> <laughs> so Right, because he lives it, in New York. He probably doesn't have a car. It doesn't get better than that. It's so like it's rented a car, <laughs> went to Whole Foods parking lot. Oh, and then one a bracelet. Yo, that means he made the decision to to go this route over a hotel room. Yeah. Like he could have just took like <laughs> an Uber to like right across the bridge right. and like stayed at an the Airbnb. Marriott. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to be fair, the rental's probably like twenty bucks. Yeah. Thirty bucks, forty bucks a day. Yeah. Yeah. But that toll's expensive, man. I'll tell you. That toll <laughs> like New York to New Jersey, there's no toll. But when you go from New Jersey back to New York, it's 16 bucks. Yep, they get your ass. They don't fuck around. This mm-hmm. shit's crazy. There's like a whole like debate and like, like oh, Jersey gets all the money because like, supposedly this is what happened. Like, I don't know if this is true, but like, New York got the Twin Towers and in exchange, Jersey got the Port Authority, which now gives them the money uh, like for all the transit going back and forth. Right. That was the exchange. I don't know. Don't talk to me. I don't know nothing. <laughs> So is that going to be the story of the summer? Like, it's crazy. Like, it's still early in the summer. That's one of the major stories. Like, I think it's a great story. I don't even know how we're going to top that. Like, I've been thinking in my head, like, okay, like, where am I going to play from? Who am I going to be with? Like, I don't know. Like, in a swing, swinger club. Like, <laughs> something has to ha- Like, I have to top this somehow. And I don't know yet. I mean, somebody's going to win multiple bracelets for sure. Um, DePaulo made another deep run last night, got 16th in the high roller. Uh, shout out to him sending his Legion of Doom on on our stream last night. I'm pretty sure that's a big reason why we were we were peaking. He was at my table for most of the, actually the entire tournament. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it, it was weird because like I know he rolls with Guru, so he was rolling with us yesterday, and I was like, I don't know if I don't like I don't like people that switch up like that. <laughs> like it's like, bro, like who are you rolling with? I only know him and Boski to be like good friends. All right, I know him and Boski are friends. I saw I saw a vlogcast where like Boski uh, won a tournament, but DePaulo like you know he did the swap swap to the top. You know what I'm saying? So swap to the top. DePaulo had like you know 25 ball piece, and that was a nice score. Yeah, you know that's what I'm saying. That's what I've done that. <laughs> you had a piece of that high roller so okay so you think people are going to win multiple bracelets and that's going to be the story yeah or i think like a negrano wins a bracelet or somebody like not not to uh you know kind of like one up this type of thing this is a this is obviously a unique story mm. and it's a big deal but at the end of the day like 31 bracelets are going to be given out so this will just be the most unique story of those 31, I imagine. Ryan could be like the next moneymaker right now. I wouldn't. I don't think anything can ever. He was an accountant. 
that like you know rented a car yeah no no he was an accountant that like he went on online and he satellited in now we have uh you know he calls himself the degenerate gambler that rented a car stayed in a parking lot and won 150,000 yeah the Rio has a huge parking lot <laughs> <laughs> that's just going to be packed <laughs> yeah uh I, yeah, I, I don't think there's duplicating the money maker boom, but I I think that um, I'm I can't wait to see the vlog. I mm -hmm. like I think it's interesting what he's doing. I think he's taking a different angle on like poker entertainment. Um, What's his angle? Good. I mean, just like playing up the whole degenerate role. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's young enough where he still has a crew, and like they're all still kind of like getting their feet wet in this world, and there are a lot of pathways that are kind of like big red x's for somebody who's been a professional for decades where it's just like nah you stay away from the nightlife you stay away from the pits you stay away from you know putting yourself in financial harm way harm's way but like he's kind of in that mode where it's just like eh the money's flowing baby let's let's pop some bottles let's hit up a titty club you know what i like about ryan i feel like me and ryan could be friends like like he rides all the rides. Like, yeah. this motherfucker's going to ride all the rides, and we go straight to the top. <laughs> <laughs> ride all the rides. That's the number one rule of this podcast. Like, if you if you come out with me, you ride or ride all the rides. If not, then stay home. And if you stay home... I got to tell you, man, you talk a big game. You don't fucking go out. I just went out yesterday. Nah, you want to play cards. Listen. All right, I'm going to tell you something. I went to play cards, but then after that, I got some white claws with some shorty. <laughs> That's what happened. That was the actual truth. I was at uh, I was at the Aria. You sparkling seltzer. You don't even drink. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? You don't even drink. You talking There's about more what? fucking kicking my pre workout than there is in a white. She claw. likes the white claws. That's the number one rule, Burke. You have to get what they uh, like. She's she's white girl basic. Exactly. Yeah. You gotta roll with what mm. they like. So mm -hmm. I was at the Aria. I was chilling at the Aria, making some sets, you know, doing my thing. Sets or, or sets. sets? Sets. Oh, okay. Sure. Then she was like, hey, like, I'm leaving town tomorrow. Like, come through. And I was like, all right. I'm gonna pull up. And then I was like, I got up, racked up, went to the cashier. They were like, how's Berkey? And I was like, what the fuck? And then I went over there, and she didn't ask no how's Berkey. That's, <laughs> like, that's, that's why she got the goods. You know what I'm saying? I was uh -huh. like, all right. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. She rides all the rides. So then you racked up. So then I racked up. That was good. That was smart. Yeah. I like that one. Berkey's coming on. Berkey's riding the ride. Oh, it's fine when we're talking about your dating life. I'll ride that ride all day long. <laughs> I got you. We got more questions, Berk. This is a long show. A very long show. Okay. So 3,000 people came in. You know, a lot of... Uh, it's good to see the community gearing together, right? Because it's like Ryan's crews, like your crew, everyone coming and supporting everybody. But there is just like a lot of like there's still a lot of pressure. Like, you know, you're playing a 32, what was it, 3200, right? Yep. Okay. Well, you're, for me, it was a 10K. Yeah, exactly. Uh thirty two hundred dollars on stream. There's a there's sort of a at least for the better streamers, there's a kind of a responsibility to engage, entertain, yep. talk about strategy, things like that. Like, you know, even in the beginning. You played a hand versus the Paulo that was off stream. The Paulo goes on the stream looking to see what you had. Oh, I was out of fucking line that hand. Yeah. I mean, that was a crazy hand. And I know he's going to listen, so I'm not going to say what he had. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of pressure, though. Like, $3,200, that's, that's a huge buy-in. It's like live or online, like whatever. Like, 3200 live is still big. Yeah. Like, those are uh, WPT main events, mm -hmm. you know, 3500 Do you feel it? Like I feel it. Like when I'm when I do a stream and there's like four tables, I'm already like like I can't really follow along exactly like should it be three betting this guy? Has he opened a lot? Like whatever. Right. Um because I'm like answering some chat of like, why did you fold that last hand? And I'm just like, this guy, I'm about to three bet this guy, and I have to answer why I folded the last hand because I had this exact blocker in my hand. You don't have to to answer. Um, no, I I mean <clears throat> I don't necessarily feel it, but I think that for the first two weeks, I put the stream first. Mm. Uh, like yesterday, I let off saying like, you know, this isn't going to be a spicy stream. I'm going to be pretty chill. I'm not going to talk a lot. Um, I'll talk when it makes sense to talk. And I played 
noticeably better. Mm -hmm. And I think that I kind of at first wrote that off to just like one tabling, but it wasn't. It was because I wasn't showing some sort of responsibility to the stream. And the irony is, I don't think the audience cares, right? It's like, I, I honestly don't think that they care because like our two biggest streams were one where I was the spiciest I've ever been with the cursed Stetter and, you know, I was just way off of it that day. And then the other one was last night. And granted, the buy-in matters. People mm -hmm. want to see a 3200 on display. But I think that there's just a lot of value to playing really well, talking through some spots, and uh, just kind of like letting your game do the entertaining for you. Um, I don't know if you can get away with that streaming every single day for months on end. But maybe for you, Bert, because you're a top-tier talent. Like, not everybody is, like, able to, like, play the hands really well and like talk about high level stuff every now and then. Yeah. So people are just, they need to lean into the entertainment maybe. Yeah. And, and the entertainment part's good. And honestly, like I had a lot of fun streaming through that lens, but it's not fun to lose. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed last night was that stream was akin to when I'm playing high stakes on stream where it's just like, Hey, you guys are getting what you want to see. So I'm not going to talk that much kind of stuff. Uh, and it's just, I'm, I'm losing less EV that way. So you think maybe there is there's you can have two styles where it's like if the bind's low enough and you're the bind's low enough you're kind of more relaxed like it's not as meaningful yeah like yeah but when it's a thirty two hundred or you're playing twenty five fifty you no know, limit hold them like any of these type of like big things where like you know losing now is significant yeah I I think the approach that I'll take for the rest of the way through is I'm gonna single table the bracelet events. And then if I bust early, I'll have a lighter stream thereafter with the remaining side events. Um, and I just think that's the best approach because like winning a bracelet event is a big deal. There's a lot of money up top. You should pay it the respect that it deserves. And I probably haven't been. I've just been like playing and it's fine. Uh, you know, a lot of the results are a byproduct of variance. I, it's not like I did remarkably well yesterday. I effectively soft bubbled. Um, but there was a notice, noticeable difference in my thought process through hands. Like the specific one was the fold of tens versus Pesh. Walk us through that. I still think it was a good fold, but, um, I would have just like snap got it in if I were five tabling and just paying more attention to the stream than myself. But effectively, uh, Depesh just, um, uh, is that his first name? Depesh? I always call him Pesh. Yeah. Anyway, his last name is De Silva. Uh, He's, I, I, he's my soul or, uh, my, uh, what's it called? My spirit animal. Mm. He's fucking aggro as hell. So we're in the re-entry period and I'm pretty sure that he's going to take the strategy of taking like pretty high volatile spots as am I. Cause like building a stack during that time is worth a lot, especially in these world series events where the structure kind of deteriorates pretty quickly. Um, so he opens the middle position. I flat the button with tens. He opened off 30. And I flatted because I just didn't think he would get 30 in with nines pre. But, like, I kind of think I'm wrong now. And I probably would have just been better off three-bet getting it in. Okay. Um, but in any event, I call. And it comes uh, – Kroll also calls from the big blind. And it comes 5-3 deuce, all diamonds. And I have tens with the ten of diamonds. Action checks to me. I bet half pot. Kroll calls. And then Pesh just rips for, like, two pots. And the board one more time. 5-3 deuce. Uh, all diamonds. All diamonds. You have tens with the ten of diamonds. Yeah, and like I think that this is a super close spot, uh, probably to the point where it's like neutral either way. Um, and the issue is, is that like I could just be dead to Kroll's range. He could just easily right. be trapping with straight and flushes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in any event, like I do want to lean into volatility, so like my instincts were just get it in. And if I were paying mostly attention to the stream. I wouldn't really think much deeper about the spot than that. I would just be like, oh, I have a pretty high equity hand. It is what it is. And even when I presented the hand to you, your first reaction was like, ah, I would just go with it. Like he has a lot of ace X mm. and that's true. But then it's also just like, well, he also has jacks through aces. Yeah. You're dead sometimes for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I also think he's capable of just like his, his image is capable of allowing him to just shove a flush and get called by worse. Mm. So like for all those reasons, I ultimately lean into a fold. Um, which is kind of ironic because like I get my money in pretty thin in the next two spots that I bust. 
Uh, but anyway, like if I weren't one tabling and just like mostly thinking through these spots pretty deeply, I think I just fired in there and I'm like flipping at best. Uh, I'm probably like maybe losing a little bit of EV calling off there, depending upon how wide he's shoving. Right. It's hard um, to know. Yeah. So like, I think that that's a prime example of why it's so critical to be giving more attention to the game than to the chat and to the stream and everything else. So you mentioned briefly like the structure and taking higher volatility spots in uh, pre uh, late reg. Like what's your, like, why is that good or bad? Like there's a lot of arguments in that, in that realm. Well, I think in a high roller like this, where everybody's a competent player, it's really critical. Your edges are going to be pretty thin anyway. So you're not going to be able to measure pretty, you're not going to be able to measure that accurately, how good a spot is, right? Like, like that spot in particular, it might've been a really good spot if Pesh is way too wide. It might've been a really bad spot if Pesh is way too tight. Um, on average, it's probably pretty neutral. So it's like you just lean into the volatility when that's the case, if you can't really define how big your skillage is over the field. Do you now, think, do you think, sorry, not to, I don't want to no, go off, but like uh, leaning into the volatility, either post-flop or pre-flop. So there maybe we just three bet tens yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and get it in. Right. Uh, whereas like maybe if you're playing a softer field where like maybe you can maneuver tens through like a call and then like something like that. Right. I would play the hand the way I played it in a soft field, mm. uh, which makes me regret playing it the way I played it in that field right because it, it went against my strategy um but yeah in a general field that's soft i want to veer away from volatility pre late reg because uh you know you're just going to earn a lot of ev through the mistakes that the field's making effectively you have higher future skill edge in the softer field and in this one you kind of just need to take thin spots and say like okay like I'm I'm winning either small like I'm probably winning small here yeah. through the three bet call or or et cetera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I think that's that's super cool. Uh, so what's the strategy now? You're gonna one table, and like the bracelet events, and I think I'll just show the bracelet events. I may have one or two side games going on, but like I played the one k on the side last night and I fucking punted so hard. Um, I ran a stack up pre late reg. I I max late regged it. Came out with like four starting stacks. And the big blind three bet my button open twice. And I had like, okay hands both times. I had like nine, 10 suited and uh, king six suited the second time. Mm -hmm. And there were small three bets. So I peeled both. I whiffed with the nine, 10 suited. And the second one came six, five, four uh, rainbow with one of my suit. And the big blind just leads for two thirds pot. Mm -hmm. And we're like two pots effective or three pots effective. Yeah, pretty weird. And I'm just like, oh, well, this isn't, you don't get to do that. You must just be bad. I'm all in. Just, just queens has it, just, <laughs> just has the hand he wants to protect. yeah it's just like oh of course that's what you had because you wouldn't bet ace king because you're not allowed <laughs> to bet ace king here but he like, has queens so he bad yeah he's like i have queens though i don't want you to hit an ace right so i'm right, gonna right, bet yeah i'm gonna bet and then yeah. you're like wait you're not supposed to bet all in he's like well he can have an eight he can have yeah, a seven yeah, yeah, i right. call right of course and then you're just dead of course um so yeah i didn't feel good about that but anyway like yeah i, I think that just putting more focus on the actual play itself rather than the stream. I, I've been streaming enough now, I think that I can put it a little bit on cruise control. I just want to avoid, you know, the Negranu tilt. That was wild. Uh, let's play that one one more time. I think it's, uh, it's such a classic. Like, okay, let's play that one more time. Talk a little bit about some of the stuff we have. I'm on so our sad it's edited. Yeah, but, you know, we have to try to get this show sponsored we right. can't just like be bleeping things i already talked wild myself we're talking about swingers and <laughs> let's play the podcast i mean let's play the the negrano clip talk a little bit about some of the stuff we have on our platform to, to talk about tilt uh and then we maybe get into potentially some interviews allegedly that i've heard we might have uh so for those of you watching on spotify we only roll with spotify here okay <laughs> there's other platforms but they don't count Okay, so, all right. For those of you watching on other podcast platforms, understand we're about to play a video. It's a little edited, but you get the gist. Negrano's going off. Let's play it. Come on. All right, what happened now? Just keep folding me? It says I'm disconnected? I'm not disconnected, you No. And shit, I have queen jack of hearts. Two pair. All right, I'm out of here. I'm too steamed up. This motherfucker. This is this is this is this is the pain of online poker. All right. So 
negative. <laughs> Not good. All right. So uh, Dean Eggs goes off. It's th- it's the story of of the week until the Apollo tops it. Sure. But before that, uh, Dean Eggs goes off, and it it was amazing. I watched it on my stream live. It, it was incredible. I was in tears. In tears, like the edited version just doesn't do it justice. Him like gritting his teeth, calling the computer a cocksucker is just so worth it. it. I think it's so amazing to see someone of that stature like go off like that. We've seen Helmuth do it. We've seen other people do it. Like, yeah, we've seen. But like, just imagine. Okay, this this is this is my my thing. It's like okay. If we saw Lucky Chewy on stream going, you fucking cocksucker, <laughs> like, like I would go, I would just die. Like I would just be like, that's what it Ooh. felt like. No, the best too is like his dogs get scared and he's like, this fucking cocksucker. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm not. It's okay. Daddy's okay. <laughs> oh my God, man. It's, 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 it's really so good, but like, it's also uh, a, a nice window into uh, the difference between online and live. I was talking to Landon about this yesterday. Like he mostly grew up in an online or yeah, in an online environment and then he transitioned to live and he's just like very emotionally invested in outcomes, Mm. not to the sense where he's results oriented, but just in the sense that it triggers a response. And the reason for that is because he grew up in the online environment where his conditioning is he's allowed to, have those outbursts. Yeah. Because it's just him in his room, nobody watching but him and God. You know, like you get to be emotional. Live, you have to suppress all that shit. There are eight people plus the dealer watching and judging you at all times. Yeah. So you can't like take a beat or make a mistake and just like blow up. And when you do, you become Madison and Helmuth. So like you have to do it in a way that like, I mean, they did it for the cameras, but like if you're that way, just in your everyday life. No, no, no. Helmuth does not do it for there. I played with Helmuth. Not once. anymore. <laughs> I played with Helmuth at the Aria. There was no cameras. And he got in. Well, he has things. an image to maintain now. <laughs> he had aces. And, the, and he had aces. Schindler had kings. Mm. And they got it in free. And he's like, you think I'm getting it in with less than kings? <laughs> <laughs> and he's just going off on Schindler. He's like, you young guys think I'm getting it in with less than kings. This is why I have all these bracelets. How many? bracelets you have son and i'm just <laughs> like and i'm there like it was button versus big blind aces versus kings like what's going on it was like a hundred big blinds like yeah. and, and schindler's just laughing did like, he hit a king at least yeah he hit a Thank king God. and schindler's like once <laughs> like, you know, he, he knew that he knew yeah. the equity the equity. oh yeah, yeah yeah you don't even want to chop that pot like no no win it or lose it don't the, care the equity of the equity of of uh Helmuth going off there was so high. It right. was just like Schindler just like rips off the king on the window, and and I was and it's just like, <laughs> it was amazing. All right, so I really love that piece, and I'm sure we're gonna talk to our guest about that piece, which is Jeff Platt, who's been kind of the face of, I would say he's the face of uh, bracelets this this summer so far. Yeah. Uh, so let's play a Jeff video, which I think is fascinating. Uh, a little hype for our our friend. So we're gonna play this video, and then we'll get into a conversation with Jeff Platt. Get this World Series of Poker final table is on the way. Perhaps maybe a bracelet. Let's go. It makes sense. I mean, for us to have an eight, I think I'm gonna go for it here, guys. That ace of spades is such a beauty. Please fold. Please fold. Can't be scared this late in the WSOP event. He folds! Yes! Oh my god! Oh! The best wine filters in the game. You love wine, but you hate that hangover? Go to drinkpurewine.com. Order some wine filters. You swirl it around for 10, 15 seconds. You leave it in the glass for a couple minutes. You take the filter out of the glass. It sucks up all the sulfites, all the histamines, all the bad stuff that's in the wine. And you get to enjoy your wine without the hangover the next morning. Cheers. <laughs> Jeff Platt, Mr. DrinkPureWine.com. <laughs> Gentlemen. Was that, was that a plug? 
Yeah, I plug drinkpurewine.com every single night. I finally reached out to them today with a couple of these clips. I'm like, guys, I'm doing really hard, hard work here. And they haven't quite yet responded, but I'm sure they're working with their marketing team on some kind of pitch to me mm -hmm. for these excellent wine filters. So I expect to, to hear from them very, very shortly. Well, I'm the sure. highbrow poker crowd is certainly their target market. <laughs> Uh, particularly those watching a Twitch stream for a $500 bracelet event. See, exactly. This is what drinkpurewine.com is looking for. Everybody is watching a World Series of Poker bracelet event online. They're on Twitch and they have a lovely glass of vino, so why not have the, the wine filters? I get exactly what you're saying, Berkey. There's no sarcasm there um, in any sense. Listen, Jeff, I could have used you yesterday. We were having this conversation earlier. I was out with some nice lady and we had some white claws and I could have oh. used some drinkpurewine.com and that would have helped me out because like Berkey's making fun of me because we had white claws. I could have definitely used some Pinot Grigio, a nice little, nice little glass from you, you know? Congrats on the date though, first of all. <laughs> how, how, how did it go? That's amazing. <laughs> Listen, uh, it went, it went great. It went great. Hard, no, high five on the sex. This environment. It went, it went, you know, it went great. It went great. But damn, that threw me off. You threw, <laughs> you threw me off, you know? Uh, Bernie likes it when we talk about my dating life, not his dating life. Uh, right. But all right, talk to us, man. I feel like I've seen you every day now. Every single night, you're, 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 on, the, you're on TV. You're like in my house every day. Like, What's the, like, what, what made you decide to do that? Are you getting paid? Like, what's going on? Like, I feel like you're just doing it for the love of the show. It really is for the love of the game. Um, thank you for tuning in. I, I do really appreciate that. So on day one of the World Series of Poker, it is July 1st. It is event number one. Um, I don't remember. I think the event was a 500 or something. I busted pretty early on. I'm laying on my couch. I'm reading the Poker News updates. And I see that 15 time. World Series of Poker bracelet winner, who you all just mentioned, Phil Hellmuth, was running deep. Now, as you two know, the WSOP.com software does not allow for anybody outside of Nevada or New Jersey to pull up a table. You can yeah. download the software, you can pull up the lobby, but that's it. That's the biggest sweat you get is watching Hellmuth's name just go up and down in the leaderboard because the great Phil Hellmuth is not streaming from his suite at the Aria Resort and Casino. So I kind of sensed an opportunity there and i really just wanted to provide people out of state with a live look in at phil homie so all i did was I, I pulled up my twitch channel i pulled up palmy's table and we just rocked with it um i i, I got relatively good feedback uh, some appreciation from the viewers which was uh really appreciated yeah. on my behalf so i felt like we could kind of keep this up Night number two, Daniel Negreanu went deep. So I got really lucky, right? right? I mean, right off the bat, I had Phil Helmuth run deep, and I had Daniel Negreanu run deep. And so from there, we've taken it to, okay, I'm going to pull up three or four feature tables every night, 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific time. I'll highlight the most notable names, and we'll just go with it. We'll jump around to a bunch of different tables. Um, when Ryan DePaulo, for example, is playing a big pot, we'll make sure to check in on his table. I'll have a glass of wine. I'll chat with the chat, and uh, it's it's been it's been incredible so far. I'm I'm very fortunate to have this kind of uh, audience, this kind of reception. Uh, Berkey does take away from it when he's streaming to like three thousand people, but that's okay. We're going to allow that, and I'll take over just whenever he busts. Do Do you believe that perhaps I uh, pull from your viewership because I'm not a goddamn dinosaur using a two color deck? <laughs> I knew this question was coming. You see, I, I have such appreciation for the romanticism of poker. And I don't want these these jumbo four-color cards where I, I can't tell the difference between a king and a four. Like, there, there's no paint. Every single card in the four-color deck looks the same, save for the color of the suit. I am traditional. I am old school. I have respect for the world series of poker it is the world series of poker use four color decks no come on berkey jeff um do you realize that the cards behind you are four different colors uh, yeah, mm, you know I have, I have no comment about that <laughs> <at this time. laughs> 
That's a great wall piece, by the way. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Did did you? <laughs> I can't keep drawing. <laughs> nah, nah. Uh, no. All seriousness, though, I I feel like the streams are great. Like it, it's been. Thank you. It's been such a fun addition. We we were actually discussing this, uh, Berkey and I. Uh, a couple days ago, like he was playing like this massive game online, like it was 100, 200 no limit hold'em, and uh, he was like up or you know the swings are crazy, whatever. But he was like winning a lot, and we were kind of discussing like why don't these cash games like get coverage by some sort of media source? Like this is a huge game, like 100, 200 yeah. on an on an American platform is something that used to be meaningful, like. Back in the day, there was like Rail Heaven. There was things like that. Right. And when these games pop off, it seems like there should be some sort of coverage there. What, what, are, you, what are you thinking about that? I agree with that because if you look at the live poker viewing options that poker fans have, they do love the high stakes action that Poker After Dark provides. So it's not like everybody's just waiting for poker tournaments to be shown and that is where they tune into. Um, there's there's a bonus to showing high stakes cash games. I'm not quite sure if in the live realm that cash games can be as appealing as tournaments. If I'm not showing whole cards in a cash game and if I'm not showing whole cards in a tournament, that tournament can at least build upon mm -hmm. certain storylines because in the end we're playing down to a winner yeah. That winner gets a couple hundred thousand dollars. That winner receives a World Series of Poker bracelet. Um, cash, I'm just not sure if the same enthusiasm would be there. Now, if you put those exact same cash games on a delay, like Berkey's been doing, and you can see the whole cards and you can see what players have, I do think that there is an audience for that. And, and I think we'll see some, some more experimentation moving forward. You know, this... Uh, these last six months or whatever it's been have obviously been awful. It's opened the door in a sense because it's allowed production companies like yours, like Poker Central's, to to experiment with some things. To Why not try to be innovative at this point? Why not build a virtual studio for a tournament, build a virtual studio for a cash game? If it doesn't work, no problem. If it does work, you have added content that you can showcase moving forward in the future. So I, I, again, I do think that the door is open for high stakes cash games online. I'm just not quite sure if it look, if it works in the live element when you can't see whole cards. Uh, is, what, what made you decide to stream your own play? And has that, have you found that to be like a bit of a burden on your thought process? Like, does it help? Does it hurt? Cause personally, like, I think I'm giving up a lot of EV doing it. Mm -hmm. But um, I also like don't mind because I feel like I'm sound enough in my strategy that uh, I can I can make proper adjustments. Yeah, it's a great question. It's always something that I had kind of warned the audience about. So I said, you know, we'll be here every night at 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific time. And there's a chance that I'll still be in the event that I'll be playing and you can watch me play poker. And everybody's like, there's probably no chance. And like, you're probably right. But but when you subscribe to solve for why i think you become a better tournament player and so for event number seven or whatever it was i was running deep in this tournament and so i, I figured if we're going on at 10 p.m pacific every night then we're still going to go on at 10 p.m pacific and i'm just going to play i'm going to show my whole cards i'm going to uh put it on a delay and i'm not um i'm not afraid of quote unquote making a mistake you know i'm not a professional poker player. I, I mean, if people in the chat chime in and they're like, oh, how could you call off there? How could you make that bluff? You suck at poker. I mean, it doesn't really matter to me. You know, I, I'm kind of just trying to put on a, a show. And, and on the other hand, though, I, I'm not just trying to be heroic or just trying to go ham for the sake of the chat. I think streaming helps me, Berkey, because it, it makes me talk through my hands so much more in the thought process that goes behind every single one of these hands. Even if I think it's a really simple decision, I still want to explain it for people who are relatively new to the game, who are relatively new to my Twitch channel. So I think it's helped. In fact, in the hour before um, I went on Twitch last week, I was pretty nervous. Like I, I could just feel the nerves, you know, as this is a World Series of Poker bracelet event. But once 
I started streaming and got to talk with the chat about everything, I, I, I don't know. I just felt much more uh, relaxed. It, it was a, a different kind of feeling than I expected, and I enjoyed it. Is it something that I'm going to do often moving forward? No. Will I do it if I'm fortunate enough to run deep in a World Series of Poker event? Yes. Yeah, it's interesting because like we were having this conversation too of what are your plans after at, like the WSOP is over because mm -hmm. like you're building an audience, you're 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 capturing what seems to be a need in the community. Like there, there's no one that's just like broadcasting these things without having themselves on it. Uh, do you have potential plans of like making this a thing? Like people are subscribing to you, people want to see you. They they like your 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 uh, drinkpurewine.com. <laughs> okay. So, so what do you have any sort of aspirations of potentially doing this uh, moving forward outside of that? I do because I, I I do think that there is a market there, like you just mentioned, and we still have bracelet events starting on August first. Now, is this something that could run past September? Could you incorporate World Poker Tour online events? Could I pull up some party poker tables potentially with the same kind of audience be there? But probably not, but is it still a viable option for me? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that this global pandemic, that everyone being in quarantine has enhanced the online poker content lineup. So if I can always be here to be your guy who you can count on when there's a big tournament, when there are a bunch of big names left, then I'm going to take you through it. Now, it, it's going to be more difficult for me when the events are outside of the US, right? And, mm -hmm. and we know that there is going to be so much more competition on Twitch because Twitch viewers are probably just gonna watch Lex, probably mm -hmm. just gonna watch Spraggy. I'm not, I'm not sure kind of where I would fall on that kind of a lineup. So I think initially I will try certain things out and then we'll just see where it goes. But I, I'm absolutely locked in to WorldSeriesOfPoker.com events, the US events every single night through the 31st. So your background, it is it is like in media, like you had uh, worked outside of the poker industry in, mm -hmm. in a similar platform. Do you see Twitch as being a platform where like you are actually developing a show? You kind of mentioned that, you know, your job is to entertain when you're right. on stream. Like, do you take the time to build a run of show? Like, is it just something that's kind of ingrained in you through your background? Or like, do you think that's even sustainable moving forward down the line? When I found myself doing preparation for this show on night two or night three that I've been doing, I thought, you know, okay, this is this is real content here. We have a real audience on Twitch. You guys have a, a real audience on YouTube that I, I think that there is something there. And so I've tried my best. I'm, I'm pretty illiterate when it comes to Twitch material, but I've tried my best to study it. And over the last week or so, I've just clicked around on random channels. And it, you'll find a guy hosting a quote unquote talk show in Denmark, and he's just sitting in front of a webcam like I'm doing right now, and he has 6,500 viewers. It, it's, there's, there's such a, a massive audience that's available on Twitch. Everybody is there, everybody is clicking around that I think that it could be a really viable option moving forward, not just for production companies, but for individuals like myself who want to run up that kind of audience on Twitch. So I, I think there's, uh, I think there's potential there. I would say I'm just, I'm just too new uh, to recognize whether that potential will be fulfilled. How good looking is this guy with the 6,500 people just <laughs> like watching, <laughs> watching him in front of a webcam? Like this guy it has to be just like a gorgeous human being. Like that's, this is pretty wild. Anyway, this is how my brain just travels. Uh, <laughs> we here at uh, Solve for Why, we are considering negotiating your contract for ESPN. Would cool. you let us? Would you let us do that? We charge a uh, fifteen percent. Charge fifteen percent? That's a bargain. What kind of? Oh, <laughs> like if you got me to ESPN. <laughs> Yes, but if it's something where ESPN is talking with me, I'm talking with them, and then I bring in you guys to negotiate, I think 15% is is a little steep. Have you but ever I'm paid a lawyer, Jeff? Further negotiations. Have you ever paid a lawyer? Um, have I ever paid a lawyer? Uh, yes. 30%, Jeff. 30% if they win. 
That's what we're here. We're, we're cutting that. We're slashing prices. You guys are the Scott Boris of the <laughs> poker <laughs> negotiation Yo, industry. Scott Boris is crazy. <laughs> All right, talk to us about Friday Night Poker. I feel like that's like the first yeah. time uh, you and I kind of interacted. Uh, you know, I had like a pretty famous hand with Jennifer Harmon, and that was like the yeah. hand that kind of like made you feel bad for me. You know, uh, so uh, is that is that coming back? Like, have you guys have been like have Poker Central reached out to you and said like, hey, maybe there's a season coming up, or or we're just like still on on hold, or you're not able to talk to us about it? Like, what's what's up with that? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. We, we've had pretty consistent discussions, I would say, about the future of the show. Now, that does not mean that anything is locked in moving forward. I do know that Poker Central owns the rights to the show. Mm -hmm. I know that Poker Central has had discussions with different outlets about the future of the show. I know that there is some interest there. Obviously, you can't make any plans on a live poker show moving forward at this point in time. But let's say the Poker Go studio is allowed to open up for certain games, is allowed to open up for certain shows with testing requirements, of course. I, I do tend to think that we will see Friday Night Poker come back. It just might take a while, I guess. How did you guys uh, enjoy your Friday night poker experience. I, I mean, I know Christian, obviously that specific hand yeah. against Jennifer Harmon was probably not too enjoyable, especially with everybody running around the <laughs> poker table in absurd celebrations. It was, it was that specific hand was wild. Um, so for those people that don't know the hand, like Je Danny Negrano opens, I three bet Jennifer cold calls. Uh, and then Negrano four bets. I call I have ace King and we go three way to the flop on a six X and, me and Jennifer Harmon get all the money in. She has ace-jack. We run it twice, and she hits a jack on two boards, which is, like, pretty <laughs> ridiculous. Negrano, like, gets up, runs around the table, tells me that I'm going to be rich one day, but not today. And, <laughs> and, like, and I'm just like, Jesus Christ. She's like, he's like, you're going to be fine. You're a great player. You're going to you're gonna be fine. And I'm just like, thanks, Daniel. Like, never meet your heroes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had a great time on the show. Um, I saw the rare Matisal blow up, you know, that we don't really see all too often when we were playing the seven deuce game where yes. <laughs> coincidentally, I was the one with seven deuce and he was the one that blew up, <laughs> but nevertheless, that was a good time. Um, I thought the environment was pretty great. Uh, it, it was jovial. I, I do think that like the thing about that show is that it tries to do what the audience asks for which is a lot of table talk, a jovial demeanor from everybody, like a, a more home game feel. And personally, that's not the viewing experience that like I think is best for poker. I think we've like kind of fed that narrative a little bit too long. And uh, I'd be interested on the overall feedback of that versus like a poker after dark lineup with killers, like the uh, Rumble in the Jungle Week. I would imagine the Rumble in the Jungle Week would always be more popular. Um, but people would bitch about the rumble in the jungle week because we weren't there like hamming it up and side betting. You know what I mean? Like they just, they yearn so much for high stakes poker of old. Do you think there are enough poker quote unquote fans out there to have both to have the super high stakes, uh, the super professional poker after dark episodes on poker go, for example, and then on your, Facebook or Twitch or whatever it may be where you can put on some content for a much more casual audience that you could still have a, a Friday night poker. Yeah, for sure. And I'm not discouraging that type of uh, dynamic at the table. I just don't right, like right. the idea of manufacturing it. Mm. Um, so if it happens, it happens. But I think creating an expectation where uh, the players in the game are puppets that are meant to be yeah. have their strings pulled by the audience is silly like the, the we need to find a way to curate games that the game in and of itself is interesting to the viewing audience um and big stakes used to move that needle and they mm -hmm. just don't anymore people don't care about seeing a million dollar pot i mean they do but like not exponentially more than they care about seeing Matisau and helmuth jaw at one another um so i kind of think that that's like the issue that our generation runs into is that we just care about bottom line and we care we, we don't have we don't have big corporations pumping money behind us 
saying like, go act like an asshole and it will increase your, uh, your Q score or your Q rating. And therefore we'll be able to pay you more money down the line. You know? Yeah. It's interesting because we were having this conversation too, where it's like the big names like that. We like they, that, that we say like, Oh, you know, they they can't win or like whatever. Like, you know, people talk shit about them. Like they still move the needle. Like it's still, people still want to see home They still want to see the yeah. They still want, like, it doesn't matter. Like right. those are the, those are the names. It doesn't matter if like, no one's there. Like, Oh, like you and I maybe is like, Oh, Jason Kuhn's deep in something. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the, the normal audience is not like, Oh, Jason Kuhn is deep in something. Like right. they're just like, whatever yeah like yeah. you know so maybe- do you guys think though that we can use a show like friday night poker as a, a vehicle of sorts i'm not sure if that's the right word to get more people interested in the game so like let's say uh somebody on twitter is a big uh, vanderpump rules fan mm-hmm. and so they see tom schwartz has just tweeted and tom schwartz is has three hundred thousand followers on twitter He's a star on Vanderpump Rules. I guess I don't don't watch the show. Heard great things. Uh, he tweets, "Hey guys, going to be on Friday Night Poker on Poker Go or Facebook or whatever it is." And this person clicks on Friday Night Poker. They're like, "Oh, this is kind of a cool game that he's playing." Like, do you think it, casual shows like that where you do emphasize the character, where you maybe are kind of sort of pulling the strings mm. behind the curtains, do you think that that could just eventually lead to growth of the game? I personally think that's the model, but. I think that the caveat to that model is that all of that character development needs to be off of the table. You shouldn't expect a Randall Emmett to just show yeah. up and be loud because nobody wants that. And, <laughs> right. and like almost everybody gives negative blowback to that because it's manufactured. It's just bullshitty, right? So like, yes, I agree with you. Like put a Tom Schwartz on there and constantly keep referring to his bio, have a sideline mm-hmm. interview. Like, what, I'm not sure how that builds out. But I don't care what he says at the table. Like I, I, and that's not fair because I, I'm not a Tom Schwartz fan. But you could put somebody that I'm a huge fan of. You could put Barry Bonds at the table. And unless he's like giving some inside stories, inside stories to like the Giants World Series run or what it was like being in Pittsburgh and his fights with Jim Leland, then I don't care. But you can get those stories in an interview with him and just cut to it every now and again. And now yeah. I'm enthralled. Right, because now I get to watch him perform at something that, you know, I enjoy, which is poker, and I get to listen to him as a character, uh, in a manufactured kind of way. Um, so right. the, yeah, I I think that there are issues. The best conversations, like I remember watching like Poker After Dark and those like the best conversations happened when they were like kind of secretly talking amongst each other, but like the mic would pick up not secretly but like they're talking about a story Casually. yeah like they're, they're talking yeah. about a story something like that and like the mic just picks up the story and then you hear the the broadcaster say like oh like oh we're gonna shut down like we're not gonna talk and we're gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. go into this story and then it's like it's such a fascinating story usually is like some like huge like bet that they had right. or something like that yeah so finding a way to combine tales from the felt with an actual game i think is good um but also the friday night poker the the best part about that model is that the casual viewer at home may have a chance to play with somebody that they idolize. And I also thought the the second one, which is like literally what my sister tells me like all the time, is like when they're able to write in and then like their comment goes on screen. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like my sister's like, I was on TV. Yeah. yeah. She's like, <laughs> right. I was like, I was like and yeah. I also, I also think, Berkey, to your point, and our, that our guy, Brent Hanks, has some big plans moving forward as far as production of these poker shows is concerned yeah and i do think he wants to really incorporate some of the pre-taped interviews so sit down with these guys like berkey if you're going to be on poker after dark on thursday Mm -hmm. on wednesday you're going to come into the poker go studio for an hour and you're going to do an interview with a producer and then just like a sports broadcast you know, the game's going on, not interrupting certain plays. There's a timeout on the floor. And then they cut to that interview that they had yeah. with Luka Doncic or something. Or just a brief sound bites here and there. Something to that effect. I, I know that Brent has big plans moving forward as far as changing the game is concerned. Yeah, bringing this kind of full circle to uh, how we started this interview with streaming is uh, I, I think that that is the big appeal of Twitch streams is that the audience engagement is one-on-one. It's very interactive they can pose questions that lead to long form answers that are Mm -hmm. fascinating, right? It's like uh, the the peak times of my streams 
tend to be whenever somebody asks like a good question about what goes on behind the glass doors in Ivy's room or, um, you know, my, my upbringing or my path through, through poker or whatever, something that triggers a memory, right? Like, and you know, I'm only one person. So when you can scale that now to the lineup or to a myriad yeah. of lineups that brings in uh, a following, I think, I think that creates characters that people want to follow long-term. And then you aren't going to get the fans who, I'm, I'm sorry, I should say you are going to get the fans who aren't as interested in like the high stakes action that mm. they love the stories. And you're also going to get the fans who do love that high stakes action and they're there for the stories as well. So I think that yeah. um, model could work out pretty well. Yeah, and you alleviate the pressure of that person telling that story while playing a $200,000 pot. Yes, which yes, is... exactly. There's no forced right. table talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, so wrapping, I guess, with that streaming thing, I, I have a couple questions that I, I want to ask now that your your toes are nice and wet in the streets. <laughs> um, first, you know, you have a lot of experience in broadcasting and seemingly some experience in poker. You know, the the, the seventh place finish is very impressive. You've That's outshined true. me. So kudos, <laughs> kudos for that. Um, what do you prefer being the, the third party objective observer who's just kind of like calling the action or making the deep run, knowing that everybody's there for you and kind of having to expose your thought process along the way? I would say I'm more passionate overall about the commentary, mm -hmm. just being there as your host, as your storyteller, just taking you through the action. Here is what we have going on. But with that said, when I was fortunate enough to run deep in that WSOP event, that was an experience unlike any other, I would say. So I, I, am I going to play more often on stream? I mean, maybe a, a touch more. Sure. The broadcasting is still what is driving me. I mean, yeah. if I was on stream playing poker and somebody said, hey, man, you know, you suck at poker. Like, how, how could you have raised with nines there? I'd be like, eh, all right, whatever. If I was on stream broadcasting and they're like, wow, you really suck at broadcasting, like that'd be like, oh man, you know, I need to reevaluate what I did here and what I did there. Mistakes in poker don't bother me. Mistakes in broadcasting will really tilt me. So if I'm calling the action and it's something as simple as I should have said flop and I said turn, mm -hmm. that will that will drive me insane. So I think that proves to me where my passion lies, and that's still in poker broadcasting. But I love the opportunity to play when deep in front of just a, a crazy rail. That's perfect because that leads into my final question, which is a follow-up to this. Uh, there's a lot of emotion tied into playing poker, obviously. Mm -hmm. There's very little tied into you doing commentary, but you can recognize that you know you you're your worst your own worst critic. Uh, given the Negranu blow up, could you imagine a scenario? that would lead to you kind of going off on camera like that? Because I think that that's the hard separator, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also like why we love Daniel so much. He's just being real yeah. and authentic and leaving it all out there. But as a, as a commentary professional, you know, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're not supposed to just fall into the fuck it, we'll do it live <laughs> realm, you know? Uh, so I'm like wondering, like, not that I want anybody to provoke you, but Sure. Uh, could you imagine something in your field of expertise leading to an on-camera blow-up like that? Or have you had one? It, it's it's hard to picture that. I mean, I have I, I've had some blow-ups. Usually, when I get eliminated from a, a tournament, I get pretty mad for about twelve to sixteen seconds, mm -hmm. and then I'm over it. Like, okay, I'm good. But you know, I'll, I'll slam my microphone or I'll throw my headphones or something like that, and I just cannot see myself doing that when I have an audience. I want to be authentic, but I also don't want to come across as as immature, as you know, ungrateful for this opportunity when I was fortunate enough to run deep in a tournament. That I think would would strike me the wrong way if I was on camera with that kind of an outburst. Even though I don't mean any of those things, I don't think any of those things, it would just it would bother me just a little bit. So on any on camera opportunities Man, you're gonna have to fight hard to 
to get me to, to lose my mind. Now, a software glitch, though, <laughs> a software glitch is something is something completely separate. Sure. Like, it, it, I, I can imagine, I can picture what Daniel Negreanu is going through. I just get, I get tilted by the Twitch setup that I have. And I, like I mentioned before, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of clicking around, and some, sometimes something is wrong. I get much more tilted by that than anything. Have you ever uh, had an on cre- uh, like an on-camera meltdown? Like, not necessarily live, you know, something that you knew was going to be edited. So you had the, the, uh, the freedom, let's say to just kind of lose it. I haven't, uh, I haven't totally lost my mind on camera, even in recorded even working segments. With Hank, Hanks. What'd you say? Even working with Brent. Even working with Hanks. That's impressive. Because anytime that I would consider losing my mind, I'd just laugh. And I'm like, you know, what are we doing here? What is he doing here? <laughs> Who knows? Um, I have had some, you know, some mistakes. Sure. Obviously, I've had plenty of those. Uh, in my very first week as a professional sports broadcaster, I was anchoring the sports cast for the 10 o'clock news for the CBS affiliate in good old Jackson, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is the big time for me. I think I'm all that. Yeah, I'm 21 years old, straight out of college. Here I go. I'm the main sports anchor. I got this. And I was reading a script off teleprompter. And the script was a lead into a story and it said something about, you know, um, epitome. And I think he was the epitome of courage. And so I'm reading this line. I'm all nervous before the sports cast, but I'm nailing it. And I said, I, you know, I go through it and I say, and he was the epitome of courage. (laughs) And it leads, it leads to this video. And I'm like, you know, the video is playing. I'm just stacking my papers. I, I kind of nod to the news anchors like, I know, I nailed that. That was a really good, really dramatic lead in the epitome of courage. And the main news anchor is like, uh, epitome? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. It, it was I would, I could just imagine how pure that was, too. Just like doing it in that news anchor's voice. Yep. And yep. the epitome. I gave the camera a little stare after, like, uh-huh. mm, watch this. This this is a very, very yep, the, the fake story. black. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. I'm like, I got this. I got oh, this. Man. You know, I'm a, I'm a total pro. That's nope, fantastic. You're gonna you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna make a lot of them, especially if you're me. I walked off the set of the vlogcast like three weeks ago because Chin <laughs> pissed me off so bad. That's how I'm prefer- I this is what one. I this is what I deal with. This is literally what I deal with. We we ended the show. I honestly, right now, I don't even remember what it was. But I just looked at him and I just stared and he goes, Berkey didn't like that one. <laughs> you got to take chances. That's the whole thing. You got to take chances. If, right. you don't, if you don't take chances, you don't succeed. And then he didn't like that one. So I ended, you know, the show ended. It ended early. Where did you guys find this hidden uh, broadcasting talent? I'm, I swear I'm not just saying that because I'm on the show or to suck up to you guys. But you two are seem to me like pretty natural co-hosts. This is what it say. is. This is what it is. And I wrote this down because I thought about you. Every rapper wants to be a baller and every baller wants to be a rapper. Mm. And that's what it is. Like you're a rapper mm. and you want to ball with us and we want to ball and we want to rap. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is what, this is what, it, this is what it comes down to. Like it, it's, it's the story of our lives. That's a good point. I want to be a poker player. Yeah. You guys want to be a poker broadcaster. Exactly. And we then, just, you know, we just want to make money without losing money or risking money. And uh, you don't have enough risk in your life. So it's, it's a mutual exchange at this point. Right. There is a, there is a, a certain amount of welcome uh, stability for me being a poker broadcaster that I can just enjoy poker for the love of the game. I can be passionate about it, but I don't have to go through the emotional roller coaster rides that you guys have been through. All right, man. I think I'm going to let you go after this. Uh, you know, I, I have one more one last question. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then we're done. So, I need your best wine. If you're like really into the in, into that person though, like like you're trying like you know it's probably like date number three, and you're like trying to pull out the big guns, and you're like, all right, I got this dr- this wine from drinkpurewine.com, and like you're going <laughs> you're going to like this wine, boom. Mm. And then I need I, I also need wait wait, wait. this this okay. the second part is important. Okay. I need like the one where it's just like you 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 really just like it, it's a side gig, you know what I mean? You like, pick it up at the yeah, gas station. Yeah, yeah like it's not house. it's not like the it, she like she or he might not be the one, you know, but like you're still not sure. So and, and you still need, you know, you're you're a wine connoisseur kind of thing, but like, you know, you're not trying to drop like a couple hundred on this one. So, it's an excellent question, by the way. I would say 
the big impressive bottle that's brought to the table on date three. Now, keep in mind in date three, whether subconsciously or not, we're, we're trying to insert like little brags, subtle brags about ourselves. We don't want to come across as arrogant or cocky, but right, we, we all know it. Like, okay, maybe if I start to bring up this situation and we let her go first and then I can come in. Oh, well, I just so happen to. Oh, blah, man, blah, we're blah. dying. We're <laughs> dying. We stop. Day three, we're trying to insert little. That's just, that's the line you go with. <laughs> subtle. It, it, the word choice, <laughs> fair, fairly questionable. Sure. No, we, we get not, it, man. Try to get your beak wet. Please do not clip that. Please do not edit that. But yeah, you're you're trying to throw out these uh, subtle brags of sorts. Yeah. And so if I order a bottle of, let's say, Camus, okay. I, you know, I, I personally think it tastes good. Now, I drink wine a ton. I don't really know anything about wine. But I do know when you say the word Camus mm. in certain circles, people are like, oh, and, you know, on uh, the Bella show on E, they drink a lot of Camus. So okay. it, it just it just cannot be wrong. I don't know anything about top price wines. Mm. I don't know anything about expensive wines. But if I say Camus, I know that we're going to be fine. Now, the secondary option, which is more like date nine, date 10, Ooh, as we shit. move forward in this relationship, I think I'm going to go with a bottle of uh, Mayomi. Is it, the bottle's like 16 to 20 bucks. Ooh, Tastes great. Cheap. Perfect. That's all you need. So there you go. I wrote them down. Ben Landry's Camus. So it must be good. Camus and Mayomi. Mm. Camus is the one. That and they came. always order flowers in the, in the Ivy's room. Flowers is popular. Mm. It's expensive, if, though. It, if I had the budget of, of Ben Lamb, I might go yeah. a little more ham. I obviously don't know anything. It, it could be watch as grape juice for all I fucking know. <laughs> all I know is I'm trying to came. I got I got the strategy. Camus is one, date three. When you're trying to insert something little, insert something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> never never gonna live that one down. <laughs> oh no, Jeffy boy, this this is gonna be a meme. <laughs> and Mayomi oh, Mayomi boy. is date number nine. But like, which one's like the one just like you met her tonight? Like Yellowfin. That's what they sell at the gas station. Like you right? just met her, like <laughs> like you just you just met him tonight. Like you met her or him tonight, and you're just like, oh, like let's go back to my place and like one bottle. Which one's that one? I would go. I would go with a Martin Ray. Martin Ray. Pinot Noir. Mm, I think Pinot that's Noir. kind of in the middle of the two that we just mentioned. Martin I would go with White Claws. Pinot. Noir. <laughs> right. Per, per Christians. <laughs> Noir. White Claws. Listen. All right. They did their purpose. Okay. God damn. White they did their purpose. Dude. So very. All right. All right. Uh -huh. There we go. I say how it is, man. This is the realest podcast, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. So really appreciate you, Jeff, coming on and being a good sport yeah. with all the with all the questions, man. It was great. Yeah, for real. Thanks for the streams. I, I genuinely do enjoy them. And uh when I turn you off, I stop watching. Sorry, Tuck. Oh <laughs> shit. I'm kidding. I'm uh, kidding. Not, not going to comment on that, but I do no, genuinely no, appreciate y'all's support and uh, I'm thrilled to be on with you both. Keep up the awesome work. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. I'm gonna tell him to pay you. Fifteen <laughs> percent. <laughs> Gotta get that commission. All right, man. I thought that was a. I thought that was great. I thought that was. Uh, yeah, I definitely. feel like we've had uh, really good guests so far. Yeah, they're. He's our first non-female guest. I thought we were just gonna keep with the theme. But he knows more wine than them. That could possibly be true. Yeah, I have three different bottles. I'm about to cop for he was, all different purposes. He was talking about a wine filter, and I'm th sitting there thinking, like, what? the fuck what's a wine filter? it's a wine filter yeah. <laughs> it's like a brita for wine what's a brita it takes like all the the yeah, all the shit out of the water okay or in this instance the wine <laughs> the histamines mm. i don't know man that was such a, that was such a good interview it was like we touched so many topics like broadcasting the future of like media online and just like his plans of potentially moving forward with with stuff i think there should be coverage of online cash games if, I, if there's a way to do it yeah yeah yeah. I, yeah yeah that's the weird thing is like especially in america like we don't have it right well like i i mean there's like super easy lazy ways to do it too so i remember like five maybe six years ago when wsop first started i was playing 510 deep and we played a 26 hour session, mm -hmm. the six of us that were playing, and there was like $80,000 on the table. 
in a two in a two K. Yeah, camp. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, and Don Peter Donnie Peters was just like tweeting every like 15, 20 minutes the the big hands that like he could observe from wherever he was. And it got like a lot of traction. Uh so like that's you know, and, and that's not something that like poker news needs to do. Right. Like just somebody who's a fan that's able to watch and rail. Oh yeah. When we were playing those three games of fifty a hundred, there was like thirty two people on the rail. So it's just like I, I think that's the big difference is that there's so many hoops to jump through to be uh an outside viewer now. Yeah. That it's really hard to drive any like rail he- heaven, you could just watch. Yeah. From you anywhere. In yeah, the world. yeah. You could just like literally just watch everybody got the viewership of it. So like a discussion could could formulate off of that. Now with Twitter and other social platforms, it's like that's the place to have that discussion. That's what drives the eyeballs to poker. That leads me to our next topic, which is WSOP Global as well as the hoops that are kind of America's putting on everyone to play poker. So it starts this weekend. WSOP Global, more bracelets. And of course, the topic at least for for this section for now, is are Americans going to play them? Mm -hmm. For now, we're generally not allowed to play them. Right. Right. But there's ways around it. And I want to introduce this video from Rob Young. And it kind of tells us like, okay, this is what maybe some of the operators are thinking. A little bit on the player's side, what things are facilitating uh, the ability for people to get on these uh, sites. So I want to play this Rob Young video. Of course, again, if you are watching on, I'm oh, sorry, or listening on a podcast platform, understand I'm about to play a video from Rob Young. And you should like, subscribe, and share with your friends because we're getting the best. You get, you get strategy, you get wine, you get more strategy on dates, you get... <laughs> You get insert little things in different places. Like, it's just crazy right now. Like, this is the realest podcast. But for now, we're going to play this Rob Young video. Let's get it popping. Um, so, you know, I mean, I definitely think uh, more operators like GG will come to the market with Bitcoin. Right. Bitcoin, you can deposit. What, what, what's the government going to do? What's the American government going to do? I go to Costa Rica, I set up an online business, I write some good software. American players can't play. I'm happy for them to use VPN. Deposit on Bitcoin, job done. Can never be controlled. Right. Well, Rob Young, of course, partner in Party Poker Global. And he is saying more, more player, more sites like GG are going to pop up. Because there is money in that business, as well as the fact that you can deposit via Bitcoin now put, puts that uh, payment processor wall all the way down. You VPN into the sites, and there you go. You can do that from Florida. You can do that from Las Vegas. You can do that from anywhere in the world. And that's what I don't want to speak for GG. I don't want to get sued or whatever, but I'm assuming allegedly that they are expecting that to happen it'll boost their prize pools and there's nothing really that could be done yeah <clears throat> i don't know how much wsop being attached matters because they are a regulated site so i don't know if they'll hold gg to a higher standard or scrutinize more um you know there are grumblings that where vpning in the past was kind of overlooked. It may be policed a little bit harder this time around. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Rob's right. Uh, it, you don't even need to go to the degree of VPNing. Like that's exactly what America Card Room's doing. They're a Bitcoin operated um, uh, platform, and they just offer their service in America. You know, they don't they don't discriminate because I don't think they have any aspirations of being regulated at any point in America. Right. Whereas uh, GG is probably trying to set themselves up for the long term where if regulated poker ever does come to be a thing coast to coast in America, they would like to be able to throw their hat in the ring. Um, I'm not sure how, because it's basically like you're taking a huge risk as an American at that point where you're trusting that the operator doesn't care. And some do, some don't. 
uh, Poker Stars cares. They scrutinize VPNing very, very, very diligently. Mm-hmm. They seize funds. We saw the Gordon Veo uh, issue where he had 750k seized. He tried to take it to court. Yeah, um, which was kind of crazy because like he's fighting a legal battle where he knows that he's lying, <laughs> trying to plead a case uh, that he's in the right and deserves the money. It's like that's different if you're if you're just saying like there's nothing against VPNing in your TOCs, but there is. Right. Um, and then, you know, it seems like Gigi's turning the other eye or turning a blind eye, but in this instance where the borders are shut down, it's a huge risk, right? If you just VPN out of Vegas and, um, they, even though they made it very loose, right? Literally all you need is proof of an Airbnb elsewhere, Mm -hmm. but if, how did you get there? Exactly. Where's the airplane ticket? Yeah. Like if, if, if the borders are just shut down and there's nothing you can do to facilitate a means to an end for having gotten from America to somewhere else. Like there's proof that you played a WSOP.com event on day X Mm -hmm. and then day Y you're playing in GG event where you're claiming to be in Canada, but there's no way to cross the border. It's, it's, it's super flimsy. So now you're just like completely at the mercy of whether or not they want to police that. And I personally would not have the confidence to uh, just assume that, an operator isn't going to fuck me in an instance where if it's their ass or mine, they're going to somehow like turn a blind eye. We have to assume though, that when WSOP decided to take this deal with GG, I mean, it's not like, you know, they, I don't want to speak for WSOP or anything like that, but I'm sure they knew what they were getting into. Like, it's not as if they weren't like, oh, no one's VPNing into GG or like it's all super up and up and like they don't have agents that are running this money around. Like like they know what's up, right? Like they, I mean, whether they know or not, all they know is what laws protect them and their TOCs say that VPNing is against the rules. Right. So what, like whether or not GG is policing that or not, I don't think is up to WSOP. Mm-hmm. But if they don't, then they just have to pay the bracelet up, right? That's, I'm not sure. That's the thing is I, I don't know. I don't obviously don't know anything about like how their contracts work. Um, Cause like, it's the same thing with like party in the WPTs, mm. right? We saw big Huni uh, win um, a, a super high roller on party poker mm. the same day that he won the one K on WSOP.com. Yeah, so it's just like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's out there. It's clear. It's obvious. Um, they're using real names. So it's not like anything's being hidden at this point. And, you know, to be fair, like, who cares? Right? Like, that's the side I'm on usually. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's like just one of those things where it's the same as playing ACR. Mm-hmm. Like, the American government doesn't okay this. But at the same time, it's no risk to you as the consumer. So who cares? Like, it's not a moral gray area as a poker player, is my point. Right, you're not doing anything to harm your fellow poker player. Right, this is just simply between customer and operator, and trying to find some sort of like happy footing where everybody's ass is kind of covered. Yeah, and you know, up until this point, I think most of these sites, uh, less stars, are kind of just on a don't ask, don't tell policy, and that's fine. But it's also gotten like a little bit egregious where the WSOP circuit when it was running on GG, people were just like openly saying that they were VPNing like on social media and a bunch of other areas. They're just, you know, they're making a joke of it all. And it's just like, why are you biting the hand that feeds you? Mm. Just, you know, yes, this is happening. Sure. And nobody seems to care, but why be arrogant about it? Why be so in the face? This is why these people can never be in a gang or in a mob because like, it's also why we can't have nice things. Well, yeah, but like, the, like imagine you were in a mob and like you literally bite in the hand that feeds you. It's like, oh yeah, like I'm a mobster. Like you never say that, <laughs> right? Yeah, like, you never say you're like sanitation. You, you never be like, yo, like I'm a blood or like whatever. Like you don't walk around like maybe a little bit. You walk around like yo, so whoop, like whatever. But like you don't really like say that, say that. Sure, you know what I'm saying. Back in Jersey, is like Grape Street, like it was the Crips, like you know, like you gotta know, you gotta roll, you gotta ride all the rides, but you don't snitch mm-hmm. especially not self snitch on yourself that's dumb shit ever i'm vpning you're an idiot yeah don't say it yeah Just do it right oh man these people
people. They bother me, man. They fucking bother me. I don't understand. It's why we can't have nice things. The way you phrase it, too politically correct. You got to say it the way I say it. Like, you don't go around going, so whoop. You don't do that. <laughs> okay. All right. So, you like that? That's cool. No, I don't know <laughs> what the fuck you're saying, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know, you got to roll with me, man. All right. So, how about the people that say, well, you're not VPNing. I'm sorry, you don't enforce VPN, meaning you don't enforce other things. You, you probably have people in there with like assistance and like all this other stuff. Does that bother you? I mean, I think that's a big problem, obviously. But I think that that is the the trouble with that is that the operators aren't disincentivized um, to over police any of this stuff. Yeah. VPN helps them. Yeah. More botting, rank. botting helps them. Botting. Why would that help them? It, it, it increases. Oh, the more rake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's more rake. It's, it keeps games alive. It mm. keeps, it doesn't necessarily keep them healthy because the bots are obviously sucking out, um, EV from the pools, but you know, it increases prize pools. It, it increases player pools for, for cash, whatever the case may be. Anything that's going to up their traffic is beneficial from the operating standpoint. Uh, now, RTA is something that they should want to police very heavily to the point where like, I think it's reasonable for them to restrict HUDs or almost eliminate them altogether because what you don't want is, um, is a mass discrepancy in edge. You don't want a bunch of huge edge uh, players coming in and just sucking all the liquidity out of your pool. Mm -hmm. So they are incentivized to police that stuff pretty diligently and increase security pretty highly, but I don't know that they are. Like that's the problem is we don't have any transparency with these companies. So I would like to have Phil Goffin on here to talk to us about this stuff because yeah. he's like running a full blown site, and I'm sure he gets all this data. Like he sees, you know, what's happening on other sites, and he's trying to build his site the right way, right? And like both player friendly and not have all these things. Like I'm sure, like he's built from fairness and things like that. So I would love, you know, there's an open invite to him if he wants to come on the Realist podcast to talk about kind of why he likes, but also like talk to us about all this stuff. Because like from a consumer standpoint, it's like we don't know enough. Like, like we like we know what leaks out. Yeah. And we know based on what we hear from. Well, the, the other the issue, things. too, is that they can't be trans they can't be that transparent mm. because what you don't want to do is say I'm doing this, this, this and this. Which yeah. then just gives a roadmap for people who want to hack this, 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 and this. Yeah, it's like the CIA. It's like they can't tell you. Yeah, it's like all you can say is like, trust me, we're doing our due diligence. And this goes for WSOP too. It's like uh, they can never really reveal what their process is as far as investigating accounts, investigating RTA, investigating bots, investigating all this stuff. Because it gives you a blueprint for how to reverse engineer that and then... Build a better bot, build a better RTA, build a better whatever. You know what I mean? How about the numbers that came out for like poker stars? Like, do you think all sites should do that? Do you think WCP should say like, we shut down X amount of accounts? We shut. I think there should be a third party that, because I don't care about poker stars number. I don't trust it. It's internal. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't care about any sort of internal investigation any more than I cared about Stones's internal investigation of Apostle. Yeah. Right? Shout it's, out to it's, Stones. It's, it's worthless to me. Mm. But there should be somebody in the industry that's a third-party investigator that absolutely makes those numbers public, especially for WSOP. Nevada Gaming should absolutely be publicizing all of WSOP's security numbers. Not what they find, or not like how they find it, but not their processes, find. anything like that. But we should know fundamentally through regulated or through regulated uh, bodies such as gaming. We found X amount of collusion. We found X amount of RTA. We found X amount of people breaching TOCs in this sort of capacity. And this is what we did to deal with it. Putting it on my list. Wine and WSOP. We can become the third party uh, auditors. Let's put that company together. Solve for collusion. Solve... For your ass. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh let's move on to apps. 
because that's the that's the market no one really wants to chat about but that's the market that's really booming it's probably the fastest growing market in poker you know everybody talks about india and women and all these other things but nobody's talking about these apps man these apps people are getting rich as as ever not the players not 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 all the players sure the winning is the winner the winners are, are are winning substantial but there's a bunch of apps i actually uh made a small graphic of some of the apps to show to showcase to everyone uh so if you're here we go poker bros very popular app there's a couple more uh ppp poker another one there's also king's poker this is like their omaha table i feel like they should be paying me for this right now actually uh and there's more there, there's just like there they pop up every day it's mm -hmm. like kings there's crash there's like every, every day there's another one right and this is built from something it's it's built from one people like playing it people like playing with people they know right yeah. They also like not having to maybe pay right away. Like maybe like you get a little sheet on with like the, the guy that runs the game. That's fine. They also haven't. That's eaten. not fine. Well, you know, like it's a huge problem that that in and of itself would indicate an immediate red flag to not want to play it in that particular spot. I feel you like I used to play like when I used to play the underground games, like a lot of people played on sheet, you know? And then yeah. it was up to the game runner. Like the game runner has to pay the winners, right? Especially right. the people that paid cash, yeah. right? So the people that paid cash, they always get paid out. The people that play on sheet, like if they win, they might only get the the portion that they that they won, obviously, sure. right? Uh, and then if they lost, it's on the game runner to collect that money. It's not on me. Like I paid cash, whatever, yeah. right? So, you know, there's people that are like playing on sheet. There's people that like also just the ease of just like, hey, like send me 200. I'll pay you on Venmo. Like you don't have to go to like somebody's apps. Like, you know, you don't have to like your wife doesn't have to look at the the whole like bank account. And be like, oh, what's this going to like Chin Soto? Like going like, what's up with that? Like, why you send them $200 like 20 times? Mm -hmm. Like not nah, just sh hit them on the Venmo on the low, you know? Sure. Or you just like hit them up at, at, at the Aria. Be like, yo, here's a two black chips. Like send me some chips, you mm -hmm. know? A wife never has to know. You know what I'm saying? Right. Okay. Right. Or or husband. It's whatever. You know. Yeah. It's equal opportunity. Yeah. I'm teaching you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also like there's ways like people like being able to control things, right? They get to, you get to play. You don't get to play. Whatever they get to. Uh, and then of course the people that are setting up these games, are getting a little bit of the rake. You know, they're getting a little bit of the rake instead of like setting up a little up, bit a little bit to a lot of the rake but like they're not sending it to wsop.com like if you hit up right now if you hit up all all the people you play with and you set it up on wsop.com mm -hmm. they take all the rake don't give you nothing i get rake back but yeah i understand what yeah you're rake back's trash like, sure you know like but you're not like you're you're kind of doing them a favor right right, right? so people would say that the apps are kind of like cutting out the the middleman or at least giving you something back for your effort what do you think about that yeah but they're also super insecure they're cutting all the corners there as well mm -hmm. so these apps are all developed for free money mm -hmm. right and there there's no security backing that in any sort of capacity so i i mean sure sure it's super convenient but understand that with convenience comes massive risk and uh, the likelihood that you're playing in a fair game is pretty low. Um, I think that collusion is going to be very high. I think that, uh, you know, uh, whether or not RTA is available on, on these types of things is unknown to me. But the bigger issue is just liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're looking at uh, a Ponzi scheme-ish type setup similar to how Full Tilt was, except this is a lot easier to execute because it's all at small scale. So now instead of for the Ponzi scheme to collapse with full tilt, full tilt itself had to collapse, right? So the exit strategy had to be massive. And ultimately it was Black Friday that caused that event. With these apps, they are individual clubs within the app. Mm -hmm. So clubs collapse all the fucking time, mm. leaving their patrons left out in the dust, right. broke and 
complaining where the app continues to facilitate no matter what and doesn't somehow get a bad rep. New York Poker King has run this scam 10 or 15 times now on a myriad of apps Mm -hmm. and never runs into any issues. He continues to run the pyramid scheme over and over and over again, right? Just constantly fleecing people out of their money. And he gets to do this because each individual club effectively has no direct affiliation to the app that it's being ran on. In other words, the app doesn't have much responsibility to each individual club itself. Yeah. Right. They just collect the rake off the club or the, the fees that they charge the, the operators, whatever. So I think that like in order to get a fair game, you have to know literally everybody that's playing. You have to know and trust the operator of said club. And you have to trust that everybody's paying yeah that liquidity is is on the up and up so i make the argument for the apps not that i'm for or against apps but when people sign up to acr Mm -hmm. right they don't know who they're playing they don't know how the security works people could be colluding like you're just like entrusting the entity that is acr right so on the apps it's similar uh you're just entrusting that let's say you are the game runner i am entrusting matt berkey that he is sitting me in a fair game. But it's a scale thing. Mm. ACR itself is a massive client with hundreds of thousands of consumers. And if there's a breach, that's 100,000 eyes that are looking for these breaches. Mm. In these clubs, it's tens of people, right? So it's super easy to rob on a small scale like that. And it's super easy to do so whenever you only have to trust one person, right? So if you just trust me and I'm a bad actor, now everybody's fucked. Right, 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 for sure. Right, whereas if 100,000 people trust Phil Nagy, but they're all holding each other accountable in some sort of capacity, somebody will find the leak before it reaches broad scale. So everybody gets fucked less. It may equate to more money getting stolen, but it's spread out over the entire consumer base. Whereas like if I'm trying to rob somebody on an app and I'm robbing 10 people, they all get fucked. They all get fleeced for, for full. Okay. So do you think then, cause like the argument is people want to play. Sure. Right. And there is no convenient way to play in America currently. Like right. if you're not in these two states, and even if you are in these two states, maybe your friend's not in the state. Like it's kind of like annoying, right? So, do you think then that maybe if you are a game runner, if you are someone that facilitates games, that potentially WSOP should pay you, Berkey, for starting these hundred, two hundred games for them, giving them like exposure all these things maybe if you set up uh, your own games on acr maybe acr should pay you like the problem is is that the regulatory markets aren't coming down on the unregulated sites so as long as the black market is this is flourishing this much the regulated sites can't do anything to help facilitate a more fair ground so we see this in other markets right in the financial sector um everybody wants to invest and everybody wants to put their money in safe um, moderate to high return investments, right? Mm-hmm. But not everybody has access to Goldman and Sachs and all of these other, you know, proven um, financial firms that are going to show high return. Not everybody has access to uh, Einhorn and his. Uh, it, wow, I'm I'm totally losing my mind. Uh, but like his investment industry, right? Not everybody has has access to these big capital. Uh, investors. So what do they do? They turn to Ponzi schemes Mm. and you end up getting made off, right? Because people want their money to grow. They want their money to work for them. And when something sounds too good to be true, they don't do their due diligence. They just allow it to happen. They find a gray market that will allow them to insert their foot in in a way that the regulatory market won't, right? And they take on risk. And through that risk, they get fucked almost always. Yeah. Right. That's the nature of a gray and black market is that the consumer is by and large the the one who's being preyed upon. Almost always. If you all want access to 
Hedge fund. That's not what I wanted to think. Hedge funds. Yeah. Right. Well, Vanessa Stubbs is hedge fund. I'm brain dead today. If you all want access to poker training, nine ninety nine. That's that's the easiest access you can get. You don't gotta. There's no wall. Like it's just like literally like nine ninety nine, nine dollars and ninety nine cents. It should be nine hundred and ninety nine, but nine dollars ninety nine cents. You get a month of the Solve for Why subscription site. It's like the best investment you can make. Like you don't have to go to the hedge fund. You don't gotta go to Madoff. You don't gotta know. You just go to Matt Berkey. Matt Berkey's new site. I'm sorry, new videos every day almost. Not every day anymore, but. Yeah, they could watch one every day. There's plenty. Yeah, every day sure. for a long time. I'm gonna my new course is gonna be on wine, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so you, okay, so the the sites are not coming down on on this apps or whatever. I don't know, man. I don't know what to feel. I feel as if like people want to play poker, like, and they want to play with their friends. Like, who are we to say no? You know, it's not about saying no. It's about not being in an unfair market. Yeah. But okay, if they went on ACR, what would you say? You would you say that's cool? I'd say it's better than the apps, but you're still taking on a huge risk. Yeah. But then where do they go? That's the problem. You see what I'm saying? This is why the black market exists, I guess. Right. The issue isn't that the black market exists. The issue is that the black market isn't held to a secure standard. And do you think that's... Okay, that, that's a really good point, right? So do you think that's us as a community to police that? Police? Yes. Because it, it should be us like, hey, like, don't go to New York Poker King's thing because he's a scammer. Right. And that, But then what do we do? Do we push another club? Yeah, I mean, ideally, like, what would ultimately happen is somebody like a Galfond who's in the player's interest creates a black market site where they are, you know, top tier security. Mm -hmm. And that just becomes the the favorite site of the community. And okay. ACR is as close as... You're talking my language. Solve for why black market site. Let's go. That's way better than whatever you had earlier, like <laughs> solve for your ass or some shit. Like, <laughs> well, like ACR is as close to that operator as we've seen. And GG is another example of it. Like, I think people trust the GG security. Mm -hmm. um, PKC was an app that was in America for a while. Uh, that kind of pulled out and I think they've become King's poker club now, but you know, they put like uh, Petrangelo and John Andreas as the face of their security team. And like, they basically had those guys vouch for it, whether or not they actually know shit about the security behind PKC. That's very relieving to the community Yeah, because those guys are big names and have a lot to lose. And that's what we want. We want people with skin in the game that are at risk vouching for things, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's up to us as a community to hold people who vouch for these black market sites or gray market sites in GG and uh, ACR's case. Uh, we want people who have skin in the game where if these sites ultimately prove to be bad actors, we get to fillet those who attributed their names to it, right? The way that we did with Ferguson in Full Tilt. Yes, but Burke, there's a problem with like people saying like, "Oh, I'm just a sponsor," then right? Because like when Lock Poker went You're down, right? It is a problem, right? That's what's. Uh, this is my biggest gripe. I don't understand why we're so pissed at Phil or uh, Chris Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, he had actual equity. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. How is that any different than collecting a monthly check from ACR? Mm, because like he he was he had like. Full Tilt was different because they were owned by the players. I right? get it. So I understand yeah. that the ownership was acting in bad faith. Mm -hmm. My whole point is that whether or not you're getting paid out via equity or getting paid out via a check, your word to vouch for, for something like that should be held to a certain standard. And if we're going to assume then that when somebody says, hey, ACR is bot free because I'm paid to say that, mm -hmm. then that has to either be worth something or worth nothing. Right, so you're saying like when ACR uh, sponsors uh, Guru, um, who, who are the rest of their sponsors? Like Guru, no Tim idea. Riley, uh, Bro Boski. Like these guys are. I don't know. I think they're sponsored pros. Like they like that's. I'm like pretty certain about that. Uh, the fact that we're not certain in and of itself is already setting up uh, an exit strategy where like they don't have any responsibility. 
Right. I, I mean, I'm because right, like I have no idea. I, I honestly don't know if they even have sponsored pros. I, I'm pretty. I know, sure like, I think like Cannoli wears a patch. I think like Boski wears a patch. Right. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure like Boski is a sponsored pro, and like, so what is that? Like, this is kind of the conversation. Like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean like I can ask you questions and like you, like what? Like, right. That's the thing is I don't know. We, the, these roles aren't clearly defined, and I think that this is a problem, right? If GG were to collapse tomorrow, do you think people would crucify Fedor? No. No chance. No chance. Do you think they would crucify Negranu? No. 100% they would. Oh, Negranu because, like, hmm. Yeah, but he, like, I feel like Negranu all Negranu sponsors- is seen as an ambassador. Yeah, Fedor and Bryn and the other guys that are aligned are like sponsored pros. Exactly. So there's a difference. It seems different. It's not different. Right. They're all the same. Elki, Bryn, Fedor, Negranu. And uh, and the Brazilian guy. And uh, Felipe. Yeah. yeah. All that whole collective, the exact same. But you realize why they did that, right? Like they, they effectively are setting up strategically, like kind of dividing the globe in a yeah. way. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. They're yeah. like, okay, we're going to like... This person knows this market well, mm-hmm. um, and this person knows this market well. And like you know, on the low, like you know, we really know what's going on. Like they're taking payments or whatever. Like yeah, yeah. Not, like and setting up facility easier way to deposit on the site. Sure, you know. Okay. I don't know what's ACR's strategy with this, uh, with their sponsored pros and why they pick the ones they do. Uh, I mean, I I would gladly like to know like how Phil Nagy picks these people and like. W- why they do it you know maybe he just likes them and maybe he's a fan of them i think that's cool too you know yeah um yeah I, I guess like if acr goes down tomorrow i don't think anyone would blame the pros right like right so you're saying we should i'm saying that that is if we're going like if to solve for why it goes down like they're blaming you and i period sure 100%. period there's nobody else it's you and me right and we're going down in flames with yeah yeah and our reputation is done. Yeah, yeah. Right. and rightfully so. Like, you know, the affiliates for us aren't in the know of anything that goes on uh, in the in the uh, back room. So, like, right. you know, they, they shouldn't be held responsible. But I guess what I'm getting at is, like, when we have people promoting gray and black market sites, they are effectively providing clout to those sites. Yeah. They're, pro- they're effectively saying, well, I trust my money here and you trust me. Therefore, you can trust your money here. Correct. And I think that there should be some level of responsibility for that. There's a reason why we aren't affiliated with anybody, mm. right? There, it, 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 And yeah, sure, like maybe you could say that the, the opportunities aren't there. They are. It's just I'm very hesitant to do anything in a black or gray market because I, I think that like whenever we basically say like I believe in this product, we're vouching for it. And in turn, now, whoever our community is or whoever we're speaking to, they gain a layer of trust, right? And we've already seen this bridge burn in the past. It's crazy that we're willing to set ourselves up for it again. There's a lot of money at stake. That's what people don't understand. Yeah. is because each individual isn't risking that much. Or they say, like, I don't keep more on the site than I'm willing to lose or have stolen from me. Everybody kind of writes it off as, like, this is the Wild West. This is just what we have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is our version of Silk Road for poker. And, you know, this is what we need to do in order to facilitate games, whatever. It's like, okay, yeah, that's fine in a hypothetical scenario. But if we look at the collective, there's more money in the black and gray markets than there are in the regulated markets. It's not even remotely close. Yeah, I agree. Right? Like, if we look at Party, World Series, and uh, Stars America, that market is tiny. Mm-hmm. It's a fraction compared to the unregulated markets. Yeah. Right? So there is infinite money at risk here. And we saw it post-Black Friday. The lock pokers, the the bad actors who hung around and tried to basically money grab their way out through an exit scheme, right? Mm -hmm. And they did so. So it's just like, why are we setting ourselves up for another bubble? And that's exactly what's happening. We're we're on another gray market bubble. And it's not going to be the same event that occurred at black friday because the doj isn't going to have any grounds here right we're dealing much more in black markets now where we're operating off crypto we are dealing with offshore sites that have no regulatory body that have no licensing whatsoever right these apps are they're they're, they're not in the isle of man 
being operated through, uh, you know, other gaming licenses. Right. They're free apps that are meant. They're they're like uh, Playtica and and Zynga. Yeah, Zynga must be tight right now. Zynga's like, what's good with like they're taking up our market? You know, like Zynga. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think people ever use Zynga to facilitate gambling. I think they literally used it for play. And Zynga and Playtica are like two of the biggest apps. Yeah, they're huge. Yeah, they're massive. The play money games, like. There's a lot of money in the play money industry. Right. I'll tell right. you that. Like, there's it's a wild. lot of money in that. Because well, it's freemium products, right? You can like right. purchase play money chips, which exactly. is insane. I exactly. mean, just absolutely mad. But that's exactly how these apps were replicated. They're built off of that play money infrastructure, and it protects the app owner mm-hmm. or the app creator, right? Yeah. And now people are just using them for bad activities. Or unseedy. If yeah, you know. I mean it, it. It's one of those things that's it's it's built from their inability to get access to games, and that's like, in one on one end, I feel bad because I'm like, yeah, like they can't play, and it's like they don't want to play on ACR because Berkey said ACR isn't good. So where do I play? And it's like, well, my buddy uh, Joel from the private game that I play in down the block told me that I that he has an app. And I don't really want to go to those games because they smoke a lot of cigarettes in those games. So I'd rather just be home and I'll just play on this app. And that's kind yeah. of what happens. It just sucks because you're getting fucked. It's just like the drug market, right? We saw a black market for drugs for decades now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it still it still exists, but like it doesn't. Basically, we can just look at weed compared to other drugs and notice the difference, right? Uh, I, I don't know shit. I've never done drugs, but like I'm I'm familiar enough with the drug culture based on my mother being an addict to know a lot. Right. And it's, it's like, she would go buy crack and half the time she would get dishwasher detergent. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it's just like, that's, that's the risk you took. Right. It's like, or, or even if you were getting cracked, it was laced with a bunch of fillers and yeah, shit. Yeah, it's sure. like, you're getting a trash product because there's nothing overseeing it. There's nothing demanding quality control. And it's the same with poker. Right. So just the same way that it's very difficult to get good, pure drugs it's very difficult to get a good, clean, legit game. Yeah. What about if you're a profitable player? So say like you're a profitable player, you're like, okay, like me, like I'll play on ACR, right? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, if ACR disappears tomorrow, that sucks. But I've made X money here. So I'm going to keep playing until there's no nothing left or whatever. Yeah. Like, should people approach it that way? Like, how, Because it's like, okay, let's say I keep whatever, a week's worth of buy-ins on the site yeah right and every time i'm over that i'll just take it out right if it goes down it's like okay it sucks i lost a week worth buy-ins but I, yeah, I, i'm, I'm kind of like weighing the risk reward kind of thing again i think acr is the the lesser of two evils mm. um and definitely the better option that's probably the right approach to take just don't have too much money on the site at risk but just like know that it is a huge risk and then uh, let's say okay so then let's go with the app side right you get invited to, uh, let's say, I'm going to name a hypothetical person that might have a game, like uh, Tobey Maguire. Sure. Or uh, who's the, who's the, like, the guy that was uh, smashing Pamela Anderson? Oh, uh, Rick Solomon. Yeah. So Rick yeah. Solomon invites you to the game. He's like, hey, I'm having a game. Obviously, a pretty good spot for you, right? Professional poker player, professional porn star. You're there. You're like, okay, this is a pretty good spot. And he's like, I want you to play on Kings. What are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, it comes down to my level of trust with the person. There are certain people that I would definitely trust uh, enough because their name is worth enough to them that I don't think. But also, I also know that I'm taking on like yeah, you're taking on a lot 20, of twenty percent more risk than I would be if we were just playing live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So, like, to me, I view it the same as if I were willing to go play. Like, would I be willing to play a home game with these people? Mm. And there are very few people. There's a short list of people that I would say yes to. Um, So, like, you know, it is what it is. Even the times that I say yes, I'm setting myself up to get fucked. And I recognize that. So, it's a minimal amount of money that I'm going to be willing to gamble in that situation. Yeah, I think I, I'm agreeing with a lot of the things you're saying. Like, I think that we need a different set of rules for people that actually sponsor its sites because it it's not like I think we're approaching it like when Shaquille O'Neal like holds a sneaker or like he like he's like, oh, 
uh, wear this cream. It's like, it's cold and hot. Yeah. And it's like, it makes me feel better. Yeah. It's like, okay, like that's kind of the way we're approaching it. But like, there's actual real money on the line here. Right. So it's like, we need a different set of rules. It's like, okay, you're telling me to trust this site. Like you're effectively yeah. a broker. Yeah. Right. In some regard, you're a broker. In a lot of regards, that's what these guys are doing. They're agents for the site. Right. They're setting up payments. They're setting up accounts. They're setting up uh, rake back or affiliate deals or whatever the case may be. It's like when you get to that point, like you have a fiduciary responsibility to your consumer. Mm. And when you're working for a potentially bad actor, some of that responsibility should fall on your good name. That's facts, man. That's facts. All right. So software black market. Got that one. We have a lot of products, man. <laughs> a lot of products. All right. So Ben C B had an interview with Olivier Bisquet. Pretty popular interview. He ends up saying a couple reasons why uh the, the interview was super long, but the major takeaway was what I'm gonna play now, which is a couple of things that he thinks will kind of make you be a good player like today, right? So I'm going to play these four things and then we'll chat about it. Um, or, or, or what creates a baseline, a foundational win rate. And that is uh, emotional control, managing your tilt. Yeah. Um, Pre-flop discipline. Oh yeah. Um, value betting thin. Yeah. And, and they- overfold, overfolding rivers. Yeah. If you do those four things, I think you will win in almost every uh, player pool that you're in. All right. He goes on to say, like, maybe, you know, in super high rollers, this won't work. But, like, generally speaking, emotional control, pre-flop discipline, value betting thin, and overfolding rivers, and you just win. I don't know if I disagree. I I think that, like, obviously, I think those are, like, pretty major things. Like, if I'm thinking, like, okay, the... If I follow these things, how good am I going to play today? Like, I think I crush. Like, I think I just win today. Yeah. Like, because usually when I lose, some one of these pillars probably went down. Like, I probably, like, made a big hero call or, like, I missed a, a bet or, like, I was a little bit loose with my pre-flop construction uh, and then, like, maybe called a three bet when I should have or, like, I kind of tilted off. Okay. Uh, Do you think there's more to this? Do you, do you think, like, if I say, like, okay, like, you're a pro, like follow these four things, like you're gonna win. Um, I think it's a great list. Uh, I think that there's a big gap between the first three and the last one. Um, so I think that emotional control is the backbone to any winning strategy. Mm. If you're not able to implement any strategy you have in your head is worthless anyway. Um, I think that preflop discipline is critical to somebody who isn't nuanced in their strategy so the more simple of a strategy you're trying to employ the more important it is to reduce uh the potential decisions that you have and the best way to do that is to have a very tightly constructed pre-flop range right you don't want to you don't want to land in the fray a lot with a lot of hands that make medium strong uh equity right medium strong equity is for people who are super studied into the nuance where they can navigate many, many, many streets on the fringe and make very tough decisions that are pretty close to neutral EV one way or the other. Yeah. Um, The third one was... um, Value betting thin. Value betting thin, which uh, I I think piggybacks off of the previous one. Um, If you have a super tightly constructed preflop range, then value betting thin is a necessity because you don't have all those extra hands that could potentially be there to accumulate value with. Uh, but it also forces you now to start to dig into the nuance because now you're at least, you're only examining one street. It's pretty much basically the river. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're looking at where that hard line is in your player pool between calls and folds and how much you can tiptoe that line. Uh, I disagree with overfolding rivers. I agree so hard. So we're going to have a conversation. Well, so I agree in the live realm. Okay, yeah, that's but okay. only in the live realm. Yeah, I think online you're just getting torched if you start overfolding rivers in a general sense, unless you are too wide flop and turn. Okay. But given that he's talking about preflop discipline, I find that hard to believe. So if you're already funneling yourself to a pretty tightly constructed range pre, 
and you are at baseline or maybe even slightly on the tight side on flop and on turn, overfolding rivers is going to give up a ton of win rate. Mm. If you're wide in any of those previous metrics, pre-flop, flop, or turn, then yeah, overfolding rivers is going to be a necessity as a corrective measure to flop and turn. What he is effectively saying is that pools j- drastically under bluff river. Yeah, and that, I, I think that's true. Okay, but so, I understand that like, you know, uh, certain people have had data that said otherwise. Right. But I think that like, I don't know. I just don't see the bluffs. I guess like experientially, like I don't see that happen. Like, but I, well, here's, I'm what it comes down, here's what it comes down to. It comes down to how wide are they on previous streets? Mm. The wider they are on previous streets, the more that they just by nature have the availability to bluff on river. Right. right? The tighter they are on previous streets, the more that you need to be overfolding because their range is overly narrowed by the time you arrive at river. So what, you know, Olivier goes on in this interview, he's saying like he's playing mostly online New Jersey. Yeah. So he he's sharing some of the pool with you. Right. Yeah, like, well, I will say that most of this online regulated pool is comparable to live play. Okay. Uh, I do see a lot of overlap there, but the people that I'm overfolding river to are the people that I think are just generally too tight. Mm. I'm definitely not overfolding river to a big chunk of the action givers. Yeah. Um so, you know, there there are a handful of guys that I battle with that I just know are on the looser side. An overfolding river to them is a crime. So there's a a, a, a lot of hands uh, from that 50 100 session that I played against good players who chose the absolute proper candidate to be bluff shoving all in for pot plus on the river versus me. And I had a candidate that was fringe to call with. They're probably calls. There are, let me rephrase. They're certainly calls at baseline, right? Okay. They're definitely calls against somebody who's too loose. And that's the realm I found myself in is that despite the fact that they chose the theory optimal bluffing candidate, it doesn't matter because in theory, or at least in practice, I should say, they also have too many other hands to choose from. So they're just naturally over bluffing that spot, whether they want to be balanced or not. And because of that, I can now find every hand on the fringe and never fold it. Not the other way and say like, oh, my hand is a fringe hand. I should always fold it. Because this line is drastically under bluffed. Yeah, I think it comes down. I, I think I agree. I think it comes down to challenging your opponent to find the bluffs. Sort of. Right. I, I mean, I think the best way to exemplify this is to look at the lens of fish, right? So if we have two two fish type, one is uh, the tight passive fish who just tends to station a lot. Um, but when he puts in aggressive action, he has an incredibly narrow range of hands. I think you should attach names to these I actually don't have anybody in mind. Uh, I was thinking certain people. Okay. I I, I (laughs) truly don't in this instance. I was just talking shit. Um, And then like the loose aggressive fish Mm. or maybe just the loose fish, right? Not necessarily even aggressive or passive, but he's just like a lot. Let's just say he's spastic. He he, three bets and like he's random, random hands, three bets, random random check raise. Yeah. Right. Okay. Like uh, these two lenses are very, very different to one. I would absolutely overfold the river to the other. I would almost never fold at all. Uh, And the reason being is that the guy who is tight passive that tends to be stationy, but is really narrowed whenever he puts in aggressive action, I can with confidence know that that range of hands is only value and that he just drastically under bluffs and therefore I arrive at folds. The one who's loose and random, I have no confidence that he doesn't bluff and that a certain region of hands is only value. So since I have no confidence rather than even leaning into baseline and just saying, I'm going to call with the appropriate candidates. Instead, I'm actually going to call wider because all I know of his profile is that he has too many hands. That's fair. So he's just starting with too many hands. So by default, he He just has too many hands. Yeah. But there is the, there is the, the profile that just like shuts down too much. But I think, I think that's the tight passive guy though. Okay. That's fair. I'm thinking, okay. So I don't think there are too many people who fall into the camp of being aggro, aggro, passive. And that's what we're saying that's whenever right. we, by general, say you should overfold rivers. Right, right. So in live, though, I think that is the generic profile of the pool. So I'm thinking of someone that is, okay, let's take someone that's a pro. Maybe, you know, some people would say he's good. Some people would say he's not good. Whatever. I don't care about that. 
Um, I only care about like kind of the way I see him play, and that's JRB. Okay. Where it's like he's like loose and like he does check raise and three bet sometimes. Like I saw him four bet you with like five six or five four or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I don't see like big river bluffs come out of him. Right. So I think, like I said, I think that yeah. that qualifies the generic profile of a live player. Yeah. Is that they are front loaded in their aggression, because by the time you land at the river, it's very binary. And what they've come to find is that if somebody makes it through two big bets, yeah, then they're narrowed. They're funneled. Yeah. Because then it's the other side. It's kind of like this cat and mouse game all the time where it's like one guy overfolds the flop right. uh, or turn. So by the time he lands on the river, he's probably like not folding. Right. And then the other guy is recognizing that he could over bluff, flop and turn. Exactly. And then he lands on the river and under bluffs the river. Exactly. So it's like they're playing this game of exploitative back and forth. Right. You know? Right. And it just leads to rivers playing in a very uh, polarizing way. Like well, more so in like just a, a, a very honest way. Yeah. Where just the best hand wins once you've landed on the river. Everybody just kind of is like, eh, okay. And I think maybe that's where Olivia is going, where it's like, because people are, are probably overfolding by the time they land on the river and they face, like, I guess, like, if you face a bet after going bet, bet, check, you should probably overfold. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I, I'm not sure. I, I guess I would love to see him expand on like that thought process. Maybe I'll like tweet at him and be like, "Hey, like Berkey said, you're wrong." I don't think uh, he's uh, wrong. Uh, I I think I think there's just a big caveat to what he's yeah. saying. Uh, Berkey said maybe you're wrong. I think the first three points are all 100 valid, and I find no flaws in them. I think the fourth point is very debatable. Mm. Berkey said it's debatable. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna find the way to get you in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we gotta spice it. You know, we gotta spice it up a little bit. Yeah. I need more enemies. That's, that's no, fun. no, no, no. I think you and I, honestly, I feel like an Olivier Berkey podcast would be like pretty epic. It'd be wordy. It would, it, <laughs> it would be, it would be like pretty, I don't know. It just like throw me in there. Like it's a little spice a little bit. Like, I don't know. I don't know where that would go. I feel like you'd just be like overlooking it, asking for word definitions. So what is epitome? <laughs> <laughs> what is, wait, what is epitome? It's epitome. Whatever. He just mispronounced it. Oh, I was thinking like, oh, this whole time, I'm like, is <laughs> epitome a word? <laughs> no, no he, he, he just read it wrong. Oh, okay. Now that makes a lot of sense. Man, it's hard, man. Like, I think in Spanish and speak in English. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, it, it's, 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 you know, some people think in English and speak in Spanish like Joe Ingram. He's like, poppy this, poppy that. And I'm like, yo, you English, English. You're English, English. I'm Spanish, English. Okay? He knows exactly one Spanish word. <laughs> he really does. It's like, that's his only Spanish word. Oh, he knows Mamacita. He knows- He's a super white dude from Chicago. <laughs> I don't even know where, like, I thought Chicago was black this whole time. Oh, it is. But I mean, like, uh, I don't think it's a big Spanish culture. Oh, I see. He knows, he knows. Bobby Middle America. Yeah. Is that considered middle America? Yeah, it's Midwest. Like, uh, it's Illinois? dead Midwest. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's like... We need to figure out geography better. Because it's like... I don't think Florida's the East Coast. And you always say it's the East Coast. No, I no, think, I agree. I Well, it is the East Coast, but... But like that's not what I think of either. I always think of the Northeast when I think of East Coast. Okay, because I was having conversations like... Because like, like, I think there's a big separation between North and South. Like when we think of Georgia, you don't think of East Coast. Yeah, but people say that Georgia's on the East Coast and it pisses me off. <laughs> but it is. But, but it's, it's like, just like it's the South. It's the South. We yeah. think of Georgia is the South. Right. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to the East Coast. Oh, where are you going? Georgia. But it's you like, don't think of you don't think of Florida as the South either. Yeah, do. Nah. Florida's the South. No, the South is Oh, is, so Florida just like the South just cuts off at Georgia. You think the East Coast just cuts off at New York? No, Delaware. <laughs> like that, it's just done. Like it just ends there. And what happens to the rest of the coastline? The, like North Carolina is the South. Like that's where the South begins. Okay, so that's my whole point. We don't think of Florida as the South either. Virginia is like I don't know what. To Virginia do. is definitely South. Okay, fine. Virginia is one hundred percent exactly. South. Like all the slave states are the South, right? F- Florida wasn't part of that. I feel like there's a lot of sugar canes. There's a lot of sugar canes in in Florida, man. People, I'm sure that there is, but it wasn't. I don't even know if it was a part of America yet. Mm. Where was it from? Where is it doing? Yeah, it's been a part of America a long time, but like, uh, I, I, I don't think it was a part of like the South via the Civil. I see. Okay, yeah, production's telling us that 
Florida is has been rolling with us for a long time. Sure. <laughs> They've been riding I'm, all the rides. I'm sure they have. But like when you think of South, you think of Alabama, you think of Georgia, you think of South Carolina, you think yeah. of North Carolina, yeah, yeah. Virginia. For sure. These are the the collective southern states, the the southern union, whatever. Okay. So what are you, what's your point? That they're, that they're part of the South. My point is, is that your bias is just flawed based on where you grew up. Like the East Coast is the entire coastline. The South is everything south of the Mason-Dixon line. The North is everything north of the Mason-Dixon line, etc. But we regionalize it based on where we grew up. Like I say East Coast for Pittsburgh, but it's the Northeast. It's not on a coast, right? Pennsylvania is not on a coast. We're just the Northeast. You ever think you're, you think... But I think Pennsylvania gets cut off. Like it's like Philly is part of us. Pittsburgh is like on the other side, and we you roll with like Cleveland and Ohio. No, no, no. no. Ohio begins the Midwest. Pennsylvania Pitts- is northeast. Pittsburgh does not roll with the East Coast. Pittsburgh rolls with Detroit no. and Cleveland. You're just and- associating it with the the Rust Belt. There's too many belts. There's a mix of D- Mason Dixon line, a Rust Belt. <laughs> Next is the Bible Belt. Like what's going yeah. on? No, that's true. So we cut. So we cut the country by belts. <laughs> we could. We probably could because it's cu- it's more cultural. I think that that's ultimately what these associations come up with. When you say East Coast, that's a cultural reference, and there's a big difference between New York and Florida. You don't consider those two to be of the same culture. No, but right. they both have Cuban chicks, <laughs> <laughs> and they bad. Sure, sure. I imagine so. All right, so I'm gonna ask you some really important. I'm gonna ask you a really important question after this because I think it's really important. So we've gone through a lot of topics, gone through uh, some wine. I got. Do you know the wine list that I have now? Cayman, Cain, Camus, 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 Mamoli. That sounds. That sounds like I didn't say it right. Martin. Reg Pinot Noir. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna bring that one to the crib. That one's for my ex. And then now I have a little bit of a. Uh... Okay, so no, don't we can't ask him that one. Okay. ACR just called in. They said that they've got rid of all the, they got rid of all their bots. They got some uh, some nice girls for you. Uh, at Costa Rica with some thick thighs and some nice, nice mamacitas for you. Mm-hmm. And they want to know if uh, you would be their sponsored pro, but not the way that they do with Guru, like the way that you want to do it. You know, mm-hmm. they, you want to go to the back of the room. You want to check out all the all the things. You know, they got the they got the nice wine for you. You you won't drink it, but you'll give it to the nice mamacitas there. They're called you know they're Costa Ricans. I don't know if you're into Costa Ricans. Are you? I don't know. Okay. Well, you're going to find <laughs> out. So, uh, all right. This is the, the list. The list they have is they're going to pay you undisclosed amount. They said something about like over six figures. They got the mamacitas named uh, Jennifer, but <laughs> <laughs> we know you like them, Jennifer's. Uh-huh. Uh, they got some thick thighs, but not too big. I know. I know your type. You don't like the super thick, but like you want to you like a th- athletic thick yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. see you agree okay then uh she's a five five brunette mm-hmm. that's fine uh and they want to know if all these premises will if you would be uh a sponsored pro and right here just write yes or no and uh and we'll end the show baseball player here in uh, Washington, D.C. That's a clown question, bro. Last question.